Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the February 22nd, 2024 meeting of the St. Mary's County Board of Appeals, located in the Commissioners of St. Mary's County meeting room of the Chesapeake Building, 41770 Baldridge Street, Leonardtown, Maryland. I am Chairman George Allen Hayden, Sr., here with four other board members. We have met our requirements, minimum requirements, for the quorum, and we will now start the meeting. We'll start the introduction of our board, and we'll start to my left. Good evening, Guy Bradley. Brita Weaver. Good evening, Rich Richardson. Ronald Payne. And our board attorney this evening is Steve Scott. Our alternate is not here. I don't see our alternate this evening. Uh, supporting staff we have here is John Hauser, Assistant County Attorney, Jessica Adrit, Adritz, Esquire, Director of Land Youth Growth Management, Amanda Yoel, Zoning Administrator, Land Youth Growth Management, Stacy Clements, Plan of Three, Land Youth Growth Management, Joe Goldsmith, Inspector Division, Supervisor, Land Youth Growth Management, Jim Gotch, Director, Department of Public Works and Transportation, and Andrew Beckman, our video and media producer in the back this evening. Our first case is the Katzenberg Appeal, ZAAP 23-2707, Appeal of the Decision of St. Mary's County Department of Land Use and Growth Management to issue a permit for a retaining wall. And we'll start with our county staff giving the, our report and if you would please, Ms. Clement, um, do you declare and affirm under the penalty of perjury that the testimony responses and statements you may give will be the whole truth and nothing but the truth, Ms. Clements? I do. Ms. Well? Yeah. Okay, Thanks. thank you. Whenever you're ready. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, good evening, board members. The first agenda item tonight is the Katzenberger Appeal, ZAAP 23-2707. The appellant is appealing the administrative decision made on December 14th, 2023 to approve a permit for a retaining wall. The public notice for the Board of Appeals hearing was published in the Southern Maryland News on February 2nd and 9th, 2024 and the property has been posted in accordance with the CZO requirements of section 21.3.3 and certified mailing receipts have been received and been entered into the record as public hearing exhibit number one. The agenda was posted on the website on February 16th, 2024. The owner of the property is Luis Ortez and it is currently has an existing home with a detached garage and outbuilding. It is low, oh, oh, hold on. The site is located at 22986 Shady Mile Drive in California. It is zoned uh, Residential Neighborhood Conservation or RNC. And the site plan shows the uh, block retaining wall, which is Proposed at 1.5 feet tall and 118 feet long and 1.2 feet in, deep, um, in depth. The limits of disturbance or the LOD for this project was 354 square feet. Okay. 61.7.4A of the CZO states that fences or walls are subject to the equitable um, height restrictions. Um, in the um, yards and additionally the height restrictions according to the building construction code ordinance is four feet measured from the bottom of the footing of the wall to the top of the wall okay that's all I have for tonight on this case is there any questions um, I don't think so right right this minute if they do we'll we'll hold them for later okay. we'll go right into our appellants okay, okay. perfect um, the appellants, the Katzenbergs, who's presenting the case this evening? Okay. Okay. 
we'll get before you said we'll get all three of you sworn in and then we'll ask for your name and address and as we get to it, okay? Do you declare and affirm under the penalty of perjury that the testimonies, responses, and statements you may give will be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. I do. Thank you. Please take a seat and um, we'll start with Ms. Katzenberg and you can give us I was going to let, we were going to let. I, we're going to, we're going to. Uh, oh, okay. he, will have, he will have an opportunity, okay? <laughs> if you would, please, for our records, your name and address. Kathy Katzenberger, 45365, Woodlawn Drive, California, Maryland, 20619. Mr. Vaughn? Uh, Steve Vaughn, Little Silences Rest, uh, 41650 Courthouse Drive, Leonardtown, Maryland. Mr. Katzenberger. Katzenberger. Um, we need to speak into a microphone, so if you would pull that one over to you. Frank, Kat Frank Katzenberger, uh, 45365 Woodlawn Drive, California, Maryland. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, this is our presentation for the appeal of the approval of permit site 23-2707, the construction of a retaining wall um, adjacent to the Katzenberger's property at 22986 Shady Mile Drive in California, Maryland. This is um, just showing where the property is. Um, Shady Mile Drive um, fronts the uh, Ortiz property and the next lot in on Woodlawn Drive is the Katzenberger's property. Um, this is the record plat showing the property. Um, I'd also like to just point out that this was 1980 uh, when this was done and the topography shown on here um, does show that the, the, the flow of the water from at that time was um, going towards the existing garage that's shown. Um, this is an aerial photo showing the, uh, the property a little closer up. Um, I'd also just like to point out the topography on here is uh, similar to the 1980 topography. Um, so the flow of water has not changed, you know, due to um, the Katzenbergers building the house there. And this is a copy of the uh, site plan that got approved. Um, the retaining wall is a 118 feet long, um, one and a half feet tall, right on the property line. Um, the, the site plan does not show um, topography, which um, would show that this wall blocks um, the lowest portion of the property on the Katzenberger's property and has nowhere for the water to go. Um, typically on a site plan, when we submit one, if it has stormwater management or not, um, we show topography and it's, it's evident to us that um, it, it gets reviewed regardless of the requirement for stormwater management. And this is just a few pictures from before the wall was built. Um, this was taken you know, years before the wall was built um, just to show the, the yard area. Um, the, the wall in question is um, through those trees and on the picture on the left, you can see the, uh, the existing garage on the neighbor's property. Um, so the, the wall runs basically the length of that picture and then a little bit behind the house. And the picture on the right is uh, further up from the- Mr. Vaughn. Yes. Excuse me. I hate to interrupt, but I really would like for, especially your last comment, where this uh, wall runs in, a, in accordance with this picture is, please. Yes, sir. So the wall runs uh, along the property line. Um, it, where where Stacy has her arrow, it runs from behind that garage, and it, it runs on up past uh, the, the tree that has the, uh, the yellow foliage on it, and then a little bit further on up past that, 
Um, it's 118 feet long. Okay. Thank and you. and it, it covers the uh, the low point of the uh, Katz and Burgers property. And I'll just show you this picture, and then I'm going to uh, ask Mr. Katzenberger just to give us a um, timeline of events. Um, so this is this was a flood that was in 2020, prior to the wall being built. This is just to show that there how much water comes through here on a, a near 100-year storm event, um, and just to show that the wall is going to make this uh, even worse. And whose property is this? This is the Katzenberger's property. Okay. Uh, the fence that you can see in the right-hand picture, that's the backyard, and that's where uh, the wall is partially on that. And then where the flooding on the left, the picture on the left, that's the low area where the, the wall is now going to be blocking through those trees. And with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Mr. Katzenberger to uh, discuss the timeline. First of all, I just want to thank you guys for taking the time out to hear us and stuff, and hear this uh, problem that we have. And just to let you know that I'm not really a public speaker or reader, so just bear with me as far as uh, not this stuff. So <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I just wanted to give you a little bit of timeline. In the summer of 2023, our neighbor, Mr. Luis Ortiz, and I walked the property line and discussed the flow of water. He said he was going to build a concrete wall along the property side property line. I let him know that it would back up water on my side causing a pond. Actually, it's a lake, but but anyway, uh, I said he couldn't build a wall to block water. Well, because I knew Mr. Ortiz was serious about building a concrete dam, I call it a dam because that's what it is, uh, up, uh, up the wa uh, to, block, to dam up the water, I filled out a 311 form online with the County of St. Mary's. I informed them of our neighbor's intentions and how it would affect the natural flow of water leaving us with a pond. A few days later, I got a call from Roy Spaulding from the County Highway Department in response to our complaint. He said that he already had been out the day before and looked things over. He told me that there was nothing the county could do right now because, until he actually does the work and when it actually starts. And I said, okay, well, early December, Wednesday, December 13th, the neighbor began to dig in a deep ditch along the property line. I immediately called Roy Spaulding because he had left me his phone number and said, call him. So anyway, I called him, told him that they had started the wall. He drove out there immediately, looked at it, and called me right back. And he said the situation did not fall under his jurisdiction. He referred me to land use and uh, growth management, Lugum. So I called Lugum at 9 a.m. and spoke to Mr. Goldsmith. And I told him that the neighbor was building a concrete that the built, neighbor was building a concrete wall to stop the flow of storm water from coming onto his property. Mr. Goldsmith said he would send an inspector out to check it out. Half hour later, the neighbor began pouring concrete into the trench, about halfway up. I called Mr. Goldsmith and told him that they were pouring concrete into the trench. About a half hour later, uh, the county inspector showed up and stopped work, putting a red sign in the yard. I called, I called Mr. Goldsmith several times to find out what transpired, but he did not answer, and I left uh, left message. Early Thursday, December 
14th, the neighbors started work again, pouring concrete into the trench. They extended the trench towards the backyard, towards the backyard. They were adding rows of cinder block uh, on top of the footer and filling the holes of the concrete blocks, cinder blocks, to make it a solid structure. I tr again, I tried to call Mr. Goldsmith again to see if why they were allowing it to continue building with no drainage pipe. He said he did not answer. I left message. So late the next afternoon, I got a call from Leroy Owens. He was the inspector that had gone out the day before and stopped the work. I asked him what was going on. And he said, he said they did not have a permit, and that's why they stopped the work. I said, that's why they stopped the work. And he said, Mr. Ortiz came in that morning and got a permit to continue building uh, the wall with no stipulations for drainage, uh, for any kind of drainage pipe. I asked Mr. Owens why Lugum issued a permit knowing that there was a water problem. I reinstated again how that this was a dam that was blocking natural flow of water, not a retaining wall. It's a dam and would cause and create a pond on my side. I asked him why he didn't inform us. He said he didn't have to. He said, Mr. Ortiz had the right to protect his property. And I said, I understand. Where is my, and I asked him, where is my right to protect my property? He could not answer that. Needless to say, I got a bit heated and got nowhere with him real fast. He, he was set on his decision to give them the permit instead of paying attention to the laws regarding natural flow of storm water of the storm water or the problem it would create us. I told him I wanted to appeal the Lugum's decision. He said he didn't know how to do that and he would get back with me. Due to the, how quickly this permit was issued, it appeared to us that no one bothered to check with other county departments such as stormwater management when they knew fully well this was a stormwater issue. Friday, December 15th, Mr. Goldsmith called me in the morning. I made it clear again that this was not about the neighbor not having a permit, that this was a water issue and how it would flood me and the, them creating a dam. I, I let him know that I had previously turned in a formal complaint with the county about this situation. He said, I understand that you want to appeal this permit. And I said, yes. And he, he emailed me an application, which he did. By late afternoon Saturday, December 16th, they had completed the wall before it started to rain. Next week, I filled out the application. So that's kind of the timeline, so I'll give it back to Steve. Okay, thank you. Um, this is just another view from the uh, front porch showing the flooding from the 2020 storm. As you can see, it's already a significant issue and the, the, the wall is definitely not going to help things. <clears throat> um, this is a, a drainage area map. So the area highlighted in red, that's the area that is coming to this wall. So all the rainfall from, you know, any rain event is 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 coming to is is going in and going to uh come in contact with that wall and that drainage area is a 
approximately 1.2 acres. Um, the area highlighted in blue, <clears throat> um, the outside edge closest to the house, that's, that's an elevation about 18 inches higher than the existing ground where the wall is. So the area in blue is what will, what will pond and, and hold water back. And there's no drain for this, so that um, it's only going to seep seep through the ground. Um, that's that's the only way for this water to uh, to get out. The the area in green is um, the Katzenberger's septic system area. Um, so when this ponding happens, it goes into the corner of that. It also gets very close to. Um, their shed and also very close to the foundation of their house, um, all which could cause problems, not to mention all the trees that are in that ponding area that could die from, from this. Um, this is just a kind of just a summary of the, uh, the common law um, that Maryland has for drainage. Um, you know, I'm not an attorney, but this is this is basically what we've learned through our survey law courses. Um, so the uh, the the civil rule law, landowners are entitled to have surface water flow naturally from the higher land over the lower land, and the lower landowner cannot prevent the escape of water from the higher land onto the lower land. The higher the higher landowner has no right to discharge water into an artificial channel or in a different manner than um, is usual or ordinary natural drainage course. This is just a side-by-side -side, uh, representation of what the property looked like um, before the um, Katzenberger's house was built. Um, you can see the topography there. Um, there's always been a natural drainage um, from their northeast corner, um, basically directly towards the, the garage on the uh, lot one. And as you can see on the, the aerial photo on the right with the topography, um, that drainage has not changed. Um, the topography, the, the house that the that's on the Katzenberger's lot, you know, it's, it, it goes with the, uh, the, the land. It wasn't changed to uh, direct additional water towards um, Mr. Ortiz's property. Um, so we have a few photos of the uh, neighboring property. This is uh, the Ortiz property. Um, this is the view, the picture on the left is a view from, I believe, the Woodlawn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, looking down at the property, you can see the, the fence, the, uh, the white fence on the, on the <coughs> left there is the, the property line. And down a bit from there is where the, uh, the garage and the wall are. Um, the picture on the right is uh, Shady Mile. Yep, off of Shady Mile, and it's showing the, uh, as you can see, you know, wood, Woodlawn is definitely higher elevation, and everything is coming down towards uh, Shady Mile. And this is another picture from Shady Mile. Um, you can see the, gr the garage on the right. Um, and the wall is behind it, and behind that you can see the Katzenberger's house in the background behind the garage. A few photos of when the wall was constructed. Some more wall construction photos. And whose garage is this? 
This is the uh, garage on Mr. Ortiz's property. Gotcha. The chain link fence is on our side. The chain link fence is on uh, Mr. Katzenberger's property. And the wall is right down the property line. Uh, this is shot taken after the wall was constructed um, up on top of the hill from the uh, Katzenberger's property. Um, the picture on the right, you can see the wall. Um, it starts up on the hill and then it goes beyond the garage and um, all throughout that low area. Here's some pictures during the rain event. As you can see, the, the, the rainwater is starting to build up um, against the wall and into the Katzenberger's property. And this is later on after it's, this was a, what was this, a two inch rainfall? Only a two inch. Yeah. Two inch rainfall event that happened um, earlier this year. This is from our back window. Yep. This was the first weekend after the wall was built, yeah. around the 20th or whatever. As you can see, it's, you know, significantly flooded. As it, it does, this area, as you saw in the 2020 flood pictures, it is prone to flooding, but this is a much smaller rain event, and it, the, the ponding that you see here was just as bad as the 2020 flooding. Uh, this is Mr. Katzenberger showing us the depth of the water along the, uh, the wall there. Uh, it's boot high. And then the other photo is just showing after, or just during the rain event. And you can see the ponding on the, through the trees there. And this is a this is a close up picture near the uh, near the garage. I mean, as you can see, it's ponding up along the wall. But as you can see on the other side of the wall, they're still flooding right up to the garage. So the the wall hasn't um, really done anything to protect the the garage on Mr. Ortiz's property. This is the, the day after the rain event. As you can see, the, the water is still, still there on the, on the property. And I'd like to let uh, Kathy. Kathy here. Hi. Um, we've been residents of Southern Maryland for decades. We bought the house in Town Creek nine years ago next month. We've invested a tremendous amount of money and time working inside and out to make this house our permanent home because we intend to retire here. Our children, grandchildren, and longtime friends live nearby. A little over two years ago, Mr. Ortiz bought the older brick house and as is condition next door for his church office and church meetings. As you saw in the photos and topography, their property is the lowest point around and will always be the place water runs into during a rainstorm. Hopefully anyone considering the purchase of real estate takes the land's topography and water runoff into consideration before buying it. Unfortunately for our neighbor, their garage was built back in 1964 and has been there the whole time. It was set right in the lowest area where all the water converges. The back corner of their garage is about six, seven, eight feet or so from our property line. Years ago, the side door only flooded if leaves and debris built up in that location. Actually, we have the same issue as Mr. Ortiz does in that every time it rains, our upper six neighbors and the road stormwater passes through our entire property before it goes down into Mr. Ortiz's yard and out to the culvert on Shady Mile Road. We have done our best to work with the water and not fight it. And when the water flows down to their property, it flows around both sides of their garage to the culvert. We feel for our neighbors and we clearly understand Mr. Ortiz and his church's situation and their desire to keep their garage from flooding, who wouldn't? But for the record, 
There are many ways our neighbors could have improved or resolved their side garage door seepage. Unfortunately, stripping the property of large trees, which soak up a lot of water, taking out the underbrush, leveling the ground at that door area has only exasperated their water problem. Installing a gutter system on their garage building would have alleviated some of the water that pools up around that area. Better excavation, putting in a swale from the front side of their garage around to the back to redirect the water would have been a simple and cost-effective way to handle the water. Permanently closing off their side garage door, building up the dirt there and relocating that door to the other side of their garage would have been another option. Or installing a drain there and running a ribbon drain along the front apron of their garage would have even helped. Instead of implementing any of these possible scenarios, our neighbors chose to build a dam to stop all seven of their other neighbor's stormwater, and Lugum gave them permission to do it without a drain pipe. Lugum issuing that wall permit without that drain was very shocking to us, especially after repeatedly telling them this was a water issue and it would ruin our property. Clearly, their actions showed us they chose not to listen or not care. We don't know. But as you have heard from Mr. Vaughn, the consequences and collateral damage from their decision will be long lasting for us. As you can see by the photos, the wall did not fix our neighbor's side door flooding issue. The dammed off area is now constantly wet. We have about 15 large trees there, 60 to 82 feet tall in that area alone. 10 smaller trees around 40 feet, numerous Mount Laurel, other plants. Years ago, we put in six Leland Cypress, six Arborvitae to give us a year-round green buffer in that area. And then to help soak up water, we planted 15 clumping bamboo bushes along the property line, about 32 inches in, back when the other homeowner was there, to help soak up the water. And it's clumping bamboo, not the spreading crazy oh. stuff. Uh, the woods that are there, that have been there for decades, you know, may never recover from the stress and possible root rot that all this water is causing us. Um, even a week after a small amount of rain, the ground is still saturated and mushy when you walk out there. According to two arborists that we talked to this week, we're not gonna know the true damage to the trees for about one to two years. We su he suggested we hire someone to come out and assess things and take soil samples because if root rot is found, um, it might be reversible if caught early enough and the area can be drained. The longer this goes on, the worse trees' chances are for health, recovery, and survival. And we have the future problem of the trees dying and needing to be cut down before they fall over. With time, the potential problems, collateral damage only increase for us. We've been praying to the Lord to hold back any big storms until this is resolved. Our dilemma is not if we get five to six inch rain event, it's when. Due to the wet soil, what happens if these 60 to 82 foot trees fall over and crash on our house, our fence, our shed, our neighbor's garage? Who pays for the mess and the cleanup? Who pays for our septic field if it fails during a flooding event? Who pays to pump out and dry out our crawl space and our shed and the equipment in there? Who pays for all the trees and the bushes that rot and die? Who pays for the arborists to come? We don't have that kind of money. And none of this is our doing. We repeatedly warned Lugum about this, and we should not be penalized financially now or in the future for this granting of this permit without a drain pipe. Uh, here's what we're asking for. The county to follow Maryland's civil law rule. Landowners are entitled to have surface water flow naturally, which you already heard Mr. Vaughn speak on. I won't repeat that. Number two, we would like our neighbor's retaining wall permit rescinded and all 118 feet of it and its 18-inch concrete footer removed and the land restored back to its original grade. Number three, if our neighbors put up a fence along the property line, we want to be sure it does not restrict water flow. Any fence that would be installed by them should be raised up several inches and have slots or holes in the fence to allow water to pass through it. Number four, if property damage, damage occurs, such as flood damage to our house, our shed, our trees die, our septic fails, the trees fall on our house, shed, fence, neighbor's garage, whatever, the county will be responsible to pay for said damages. If the trees fall down but hit nothing, we can't afford to have them drop, dumping, causing a dam either. So the replacement costs of that, reimbursement, so far this little adventure has cost us $931.58 to just do this appeal, who pays for that? I think the county's responsible for doing it. 
Number seven, we would like swift resolution of the above within 30 days after the appeal period so it doesn't drag on and on and the situation escalates with a large storm, especially in the spring and summer. This has already been going on two months now and we really need your help. We respectfully request your assistance to correct the mess and make it right. And we thank you for listening and appreciate your time. Thank you, Ms. Katzenberg and Mr. Vaughn. Um, any questions from the board at this point? Uh, yes, sir. Mr. Cusmer, you in your letter, you think they should install a drainage line before they put the wall in. Is that correct? No, you're asking me? Yes. A, a drain pipe or French drain or whatever you call them <coughs> should have been put in would with it, the wall at that be time. On your side of the wall or under the wall? Under the wall or beside it, however the engineer or the county would say to do it, okay. just so that the water drains through. And, and where would that water go? If, if they had installed that drain pipe, where would that Out water? to Shady Mile Culvert would be best case scenario, but it let the very least behind their garage, not at the side door. Their flooding is coming in that side entry door, not the big four uh, garage doors. It's yeah, on it the side to, entry. Would it go to another neighbor's lot? No. Their lot is the corner lot of Shady Mile and Woodlawn. So yeah, the water would flow behind their garage and go naturally out to the culvert. Could you install a drain pipe now and, and solve the problem? No. No, that's the, pro that's the whole issue. That's why we kept calling because they were in the middle of building and it would have been the time to do it. There's no, even if I could collect the water, I have no place to put it because that's my lowest point of my property. I can't get rid of that water without it going through his yard the way it has gone through for centuries. You know, they bought that house just two years ago. The house has been there since 1951, something like that. The garage has been there since 1964. When we were friends with the previous neighbors, they did not have a flooding problem till they could no longer keep the leaves and debris away from that side door. These new neighbors have leveled that area, causing some of this problem to pool at the door. There are sandbags in front of that. And when Patricia Gaston, before she passed away, she couldn't go out there and blow leaves anymore. We would do that for her and debris would fall, whatever. And then the house was vacant for a bit before it was sold. Um, you know, Mr. Gaston died six months after we moved in and then years later, Anne died. We were friends with them, um, you know, and we all talked about the water all the time. Hence us putting in extra things to help with the flow of water so it wouldn't be quite so bad for her. She had no money to build a swale or do anything, but that's what needs to happen versus a dam to stop it all up. I, if I could put it somewhere, I would do that. But if their property is lower than mine, I have to go through, or that somebody has to go through their property to get rid of the water. You know, if it pools on my side and stays there, I end up I'm, with a I'm swamp. trying to decide if, if, the, if, we, if he put a drain pipe in on his side, where would the water go? And if you put it on your side, which is that far apart, wouldn't it go to the same place? Yeah, basically. Yes, yeah, so, we go. Yeah. How do I explain this? The so the I don't I don't see a difference if the if you put a drain pipe in, or if they or if he put a drain pipe in. Obviously, it'd be better for cheaper if, if he did. So but if you could put one in, would that solve the problem? So no. so the drain pipe would have to be on Mr. Ortiz's property. I can't hear you, sir. Uh, the drain pipe would have to be on Mr. Ortiz's property to get out the where the wall is is on the lowest point of the Katzenberger's property and in order for to get the fall for that water to go somewhere the the next lowest point is on Mr. Ortiz's property and then it then it would go to the the roadside ditch along Shady Mile Drive I'm still trying the, the cement block is this wide if, if if the drain pipe is here over here it goes this place if the drain pipe is over here it would go the same place yes sir but the drain pipe would have to lead from the wall towards Shady Mile Drive over to, the, that's the only place that it'll drain. Uh, I'll go back to one of the slides here. I think if you can show him the contour, yes, might help. Oops. Okay. So where Stacy has the arrow, if you could go down closer to right there, right there by the corner of their garage. That's the lowest point 
on uh, the Katz and Burgers property. Um, that's where the if if a drain pipe was put in, it should be, you know, stay at least ten feet off of that garage, the and then it would have to run parallel on Mr. Ortiz's property, a parallel to the garage, yeah, to the side. next contour. Or the or the, or, the ditch. Yeah, or all the way to the ditch. And then it would run out and it would flow up Shady Mile uh, Drive. There's about a two and a half to three foot ditch along the whole uh, length of Shady Mile right in that area. On his side of the property. Is there any drainage area to on that road? Yeah, on Shady Mile there. You see where um, you see where the, the yellow the right hand yellow line is or on the to the right of the road okay okay that's well right the there yeah is. that follow that line there's actually a deep ditch uh through that whole area so any all of this water from from our property from the other pro seven properties all drain into that ditch so basically what would have to happen with that wall if he continues with the wall a drainage pipe would have to be put in. It would have to follow the whole back side of his garage all the way over to the drainage ditch. Okay, would you put your marker at the, that bottom left-hand corner? Where, 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 where the red, red lines intersect, right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, what I'm trying to understand is if the water comes down on one side of that line or the other side, I don't see a difference. It's six inches apart. Is it that cement block? Because on this side of the cement block or this side of the cement block, I, I think you could have solved the problem by putting the, putting the drainage pipe in. Well, I, the, but the only way, this is just my, and I'm not an engineer, okay? My thoughts are, okay, if the wall wasn't there, that whole area gets graded downhill slope all the way to the street. In other words, about a four foot wide or three foot wide drainage water. ditch, just like what's on the street, but it's something that tapers into that. And that's somebody else's property, though. Huh? Yeah, Somebody that's why property. we can't solve yeah. the problem. Right. It's because it's not our property. So but what happens is, by putting that wall there, uh, word was, all right, put a French drain along there. Well, a French drain will follow the wall, but the problem is you can't make water run uphill. Because what happens is, the, where the, the red lines intersect is probably about the end of the concrete wall, Okay. That's the high, that's a higher point than it is down below. So you can't you can't get at the drain out of that higher point, out of that lower point. It just sits there. Where you see where the the, the corner, um, yeah, right there. Now follow the white line around, okay? The topography. The, line. Follow the topography line around to where it intersects the red again. Right there. So what happens is that's the that's two of the higher points, okay? So in other words, everything that's in that area will not drain. With a wall there. With that wall there. At least by if the wall wasn't there, you, would, you had, in the past, you had more of a chance of the water to keep on flowing to where it would keep on going, not standing and wait, sitting around. See, in the past, it would actually flow right on through and right through your neighbor's property yes yes oh well, right on through the neighbor's property on out to the street yeah so all he was trying to do is protect his property same thing with me it, it, it's your expense yes yeah exactly thank you and the the water flooding in his garage is coming from that side garage door again not the big four doors in the front just that side which is why sandbags are there again Move the door, do gutters, do a and, swale. And do. also, too, is a lot of the water that's coming down, if you follow the red line that comes along the property line there, during this last few rains, you could stand out at the wall and watch the water follow that property line right down from the street. You could, you could see it. Anyway. Okay. Can I ask, is the uh, wall that was built is that directly on the property line? It's 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 on the, or, the Ortiz property, but it is right there next at to the, the property edge. line. 
Is there anything where it needs to be so many feet away or not because it's I think, a neighbor? I think I don't know that when we get to the county attorney's piece of it, oh, I think okay. he can answer that for us. Sure. Oh. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we don't mind them putting up a fence. We don't mind anything they do. It's just the water. You can't wall off the water. So. Did you guys talk to Mr. Ortiz after uh, that flooding where you took the picture, that first rain? Did you guys? No, we have to catch him because he doesn't live there. It's his church's meeting place and church place. Um, and we have a language barrier because they, he does not speak English. So if we don't have an interpreter, it gets a little difficult. But we had talked about the drainage, and he could not understand that we have no place to drain the water to. You know what I'm saying? It, that was a difficult thing and so this was our only recourse okay they're good they're they're nice people i mean we don't have any issue with them but we tried to resolve it and it did not work we told him he he needed to put a drain pipe in so now that the wall's been built can you go back to the slide where you uh, the request that you guys are making the uh site plan or the last slide last slide So the requested actions. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, no worries. So you're asking that the wall and footers be removed uh, and the land restored back to its natural glade. Yes. Knowing the amount of work and knowing that he now has a permit for that wall. If the land, or if the wall and footers cannot be removed, what else are you asking for? What's your plan B? We don't have one. There is no, we don't know what to do with the water. And we haven't even had a big event yet. <clears throat> What do I do when my septic fails and my house floods? Well, you've you got know, a gentleman from... Don't know what to do about that. You've got a gentleman from Silence yeah. Rest sitting right next to you who may have an inkling because I know he's done stuff like this before. So in, after looking at this and looking at the Ortiz property, um, the, the thing probably to have done is to keep the grade as high as they can along the along the garage and then grade it down actually instead of what they did they built the wall up and then they backfilled up on their side of the wall so now it is flat on that side which made it worse if if the grading was done um, away from the garage and then if they just carried that swale around the the back side of the garage and then over to um, Shady Mile Drive, that would have been the best course, in my opinion. Okay. Understanding the um, discussion about the low point flooding. Yes. Is there anything that these property owners can do on their side to alleviate water at all? So, <clears throat> you know, if, if there was a drain pipe installed, it would have to be at the low point of the wall. It would have to be... The, the wall would have to be either removed. cut out, removed in that section. Um, and then there's no guarantee that there's, I mean, there's not a lot of uh, grade change there. If we have 1.2 acres. If we were sizing a pipe for that, I would estimate it would be at least a 12 inch pipe needed. And in order to bury a, 20, a, t a 12 inch pipe under the wall, through the wall, and then still have cover over top of it to get it beyond um, the neighbor's garage. Um, it, there may not be enough fall there to, to actually put a pipe in. Or if you did put a pipe in, it would be above grade. Okay. And the reason why I'm asking these questions is not to say that that's what's going to happen, but if we find other alternatives... I'd like to at least know that those are on the table. All right. You said that we're going to hear from council. We will. Yes. We got, we're going to go through the Mr. Ortiz first and then we'll go to council. Copy that. County council. Then I'll save those questions for it. Uh, and the two years that they've been there, you guys say that despite the language barrier, that, um, the relationship has been a pretty positive. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
they seem like they'd be willing to work with you if that language barrier issue could be resolved. You think they would? I don't. I don't know that there's an understanding there that we can get through to where there's that we have no place to put the water. We can't make it flow uphill. I, I, that's that seems to be an issue. Um, we had tree issues. We worked them all out. You know, they stripped, like I said, the property down and pruned trees and. They didn't like some of our branches hanging over the property line. We cut them down. We cut them off and did the things that they asked to be neighborly, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but this is just something we can't. Right. I understand. Get beyond. And we, we can't think of a solution that we can do. I mean, we really cannot. If that was happening uh, somewhere further in, that would be different. But there's no place. Right. You know what I'm saying? If it does this, yep. where are you going to drain it to if that's the only way it can go through the wall? It, it, you can't make water do that. Okay. You know? the, the best re recourse is to have it to, you know, not to try to stop the water, to help it come through f quicker. You know, I mean, quicker help, it, help it go through without stopping. Mm -hmm. You know, and away from their area. Yep. And again, it's not their fault. The garage was there when they bought the property, and it was in right at the convergence of all the water. But it's not ours either. Mm -hmm. Okay. It, 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 it's problematic. Okay. Any other questions? No. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> excuse me. Let's let's ask if uh, the property owners or the county have any questions of uh, of the. We can do the cross examined on this one, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Ortiz, do you have any questions that you want to ask of the Katzenbergs at this time? He's not here. He's not here. Is he here? Okay. Who's here for, for the Ortiz side? I don't see anybody. We haven't seen anyone. All right. Mr. Hauser, you're up next. <laughs> do you have any questions, please? I've got just a couple. For, for the record. Okay. Right. By way of introduction, Mr. and Mrs. Katzenberger, my name's John Hauser. I work in the county attorney's office. I wrote the memorandum that set forth our opinion on this one, and I'll guess because the applicant isn't here, be speaking to that right after. Only questions I have for you, just to understand what exactly the county is responding to. Stacy, could you turn back to the slide about the civil law rule? So beside, besides the claim that the civil law compels us to have denied the permit, is there any other local law or state regulation or state statute that you claim has been violated tonight by approval of the permit? Well, it's, it's not a law, but uh, on your website, does not it, it says that when permits are issued that they correspond, I forget, my wife is the one that read, um, it corresponds with they they check with other department departments. departments to, you know, before when, issuing when, it, before issuing permits and stuff. And evidently, this is did not happen. All right. And the plat that was used did not have their topography on it for anyone who looked at it to see, unless they checked on your website with the satellite topography. I don't know what that's called, but if they used the plat, the site plan, it did not have topography on it. So how could anyone issue a permit? without seeing what the topography was of the land, let alone our repeated phone calls and information saying this is a problem. Um, that's just to most I mean, common sense. It but was, would have been kind of a red flag, would, would have been kind of a, a red flag to them that, hey, we have some sort of problem. Stormwater here. issue. It's a stormwater issue. It's not a, you know. It's not about the wall. You know, as far as a permit, you want to put up something, it's your yard. Do what you want to do, you know, but you just can't block the water. All right. Second. Go ahead. Second question. Um, some of the pictures of the fence, and Stacy, I don't think necessary to turn to them or find them, but there were two I saw. It looked like there were leaves and debris accumulated at the base of your chain link fence. Have you ever noticed in your ownership of the property that that accumulation of leaves and debris impedes the flow of water? No, no, it does not. It, it, why, too? Sorry. 
a lot of that water got, a lot of those leaves are jammed there because of all the water coming down and jamming up. Underneath all those leaves that you see, it's this deep of water. All right. That's the only questions I had, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So there's no one here from Mr. Ortiz? All right, so I don't see anyone from there. Then uh, you all can sit back or step back and sit down, and if we have more questions, we'll call you back. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ortiz did submit a letter that is on the it's website. It's on file. Yeah, it's on file. Yes. So. Do we? Do you want to review that letter? Would you we like can to look at it or just make sure the board members are aware that it's okay. there. Can we bring that up, Ms. Clements, please, that letter? Yes, I can. So, he talks about, Wait a minute. Oh, Mr. Young, whoop, don't I slide back up, you. please. Can we have that slide back up, Ms. Clements, please? I'm sorry? Go back to the letter, please. The letter, please. So, he talks right there about how Mr. Young came out um, and say that the wall isn't jeopardizing Frank's property gave us advice on how to divert the excess water still pulling near the garage obviously spelling and errors um, notwithstanding but were any of those and what we can't ask mr ortiz is were any of those measures uh implemented and what did mr young advise right and how well, did mr I young determine and we don't know even though we don't even know mr young was there right okay. so so we might be able to talk to our uh, supervisor for inspections this evening. He, he's here tonight with us, okay? All right. And he may have some confirmation of one way or the other whether Mr. Young was involved in it or not. And then I have some other questions for Lugum okay. also. Pardon? Sorry. I say what the um, speak up. Mr. Ortiz's letter um, references Mr. Bruce Young coming out and giving him um, some opinions on what he should be doing. So we don't have Mr. Young here tonight to um, tell us whether he was there or he wasn't there. And we don't have Mr. Ortiz here tonight to tell us whether um, Mr. Young had given him any paperwork or whatever. But we do have the inspector, inspecting, inspector supervisor here that may be able to tell us whether Mr. Young was involved in, in this whole ordeal and we'll get to that shortly, okay? Uh, Mr. Hauser. Good evening, board members. Once more, for the record, John Sterling Hauser, Deputy County Attorney. Um, plan tonight is to five-page memorandum giving a summary of County Attorney's Office believes the proper outcome of these case and a longer explanation of the law relevant and applicable to this matter. It's part of the record. Um, be going through is going over that, walking through it. We also have for any questions the board would like to direct, as Mr. Hayden noted, Mr. Goldsmith, the um Lugum Inspections Manager or Supervisor, here ready and available to answer any questions. We also have Lugum's director, Ms. Jessica Andritz. But for now, I think the introduction will just be for me. Brief overview of the facts of the case, why Lugum made the decision it did, why that was the right decision for Lugum to make, and an overview of kind of my thoughts on the laws that Mr. Katzenberg, Mr. and Mrs. Katzenberger have raised and their applicability to this case. First, to go over and summarize, um, Mr. and Mrs. Katzenberger already touched on it, but the genesis of this 
action from the county's point of view, where complaints received from the Katzenbergers over alleged unpermitted development on their neighbor's property, namely that Mr. Ortiz was in fact building a retaining wall without a required permit. Uh, construction was begun sometime in December. They got, Lugum got the complaint on December 13th, went out that day post to stop work order because they permit was in fact not issued for that work. Contractor who was doing the work promptly came into the permit office and made application, gave that site plan that's already been shown as part of the staff report and as part of the appellant's presentation. Once Lugum gets a hold of that permit application, in this case to build a four or one and a half foot tall retaining wall on or very nearly on the property line, the job the permitting text review is to decide what, if any, reviews are necessary. And fact of the matter is there just were not many reviews necessary for a project of this magnitude or this size. Um, Ms. Weaver, you asked a question earlier of setbacks required. Um, they do not in a case like this. Ms. Clements recognized or read out the law as part of her staff report, I believe from 61.7, uh, but fences and retaining walls both are allowed in the side yard setbacks that we would normally have. And this would fit the definition of a retaining wall. It's also the same reason that the appellant's property fence could be built so close to the property line without running afoul of any of those setbacks. Um, there's a list of permitted yard improvements, decks, porches, sidewalks, et cetera, among them, and fences and retaining walls are among the last. Building permits and building codes do not apply to this project either. Um, Ms. Clements read aloud from the International Residential Code, the 2018 version thereof, which is incorporated in the St. Mary's County Building Code, which can be found at Chapter 203 of the St. Mary's County Code. Uh, building code requirements, building code inspections, do not apply to retaining walls if they are less than four feet in height, which this one is. And finally, and the big crux of the matter, is that storm, our county's stormwater management ordinance does not apply to developments such as this for reasons that I'm going to touch on later. So once land use, the only real review that is required in a case like this is Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance 22.1 requires zoning authorization for any improvement, structure, or use that is going to be built upon on land. Now, the reality is we can probably recognize in our lives that that rule is required, is honored in the breach more often in the following thereof, because I'm sure we have all of us, and I'll take that back, we all know neighbors, or we have family members, or we have friends who have perhaps done things in their yards, maybe put in sheds, maybe put in patios and sidewalks, and not, not gone to the Land Use and Growth Management Office yet to get the zoning approval and verify there's nothing more required. Act is, once the need for a permit was required, they were given a stop work order, they were told to go there, get this zoning approval, let it be reviewed and see if anything more is required. And that zoning approval, turns out, is all it is. The zoning approval was issued the next day. That is the only time that was required to go through that review because it is a fairly cut and dry matter from that perspective. The appeal was timely noted thereafter, and it's important to note right now and taken aside from the particular facts of this case and just spend a little bit of time to Remind the board that we are here on an appeal. This is not a variance. This is not a special or conditional use approval. This is a search for a mistake that was made by land use and growth management. You need to find one of two things to be able to grant this appeal and even consider whether it's appropriate to overturn that permit or attach conditions on it. You need to either identify a law that Lugham failed to apply that they should have and were required to, or you need to find that there was a mistake applying a law they did. And you're not going to find either one of those in this case. Um, the only, Lugum's job is to enforce our local laws. It enforces the Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance. It enforces the other ordinance we have in past that interface or interact with that Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance. It enforces anything else that either the Maryland Annotated Code or COMAR says it must incorporate as part of its review process. That is all the planning director, which is what the Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance calls the Director of Land Use and Growth Management, is charged to do. So unless there is a part of the Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance or the Stormwater Management Ordinance or another local relevant law that compelled Lugham to take an action other than they did today, you cannot grant this appeal. The only mechanism 
available to the county in a case like this to provide for stormwater management, to make these sorts of inquiries and ask whether that retaining wall is proper or whether there really should be other mechanisms put into it is the application of our stormwater management ordinance. Uh, we are required to have a stormwater management ordinance by state law. It has to meet certain minimum standards. It has to be approved by the state before it can be put into effect. Our stormwater management was approved by the state, and our storm management ordinance does charge with the county with adopting and carrying out through that ordinance a comprehensive plan of stormwater management treatment. We have to make sure that development will not uh, unfairly or adversely affect other neighbors or create a nuisance to them. The reason that stormwater ordinance and none of its provisions apply in a case like this is because by law that stormwater ordinance is also required to have waivers and exemptions. And the projects like this are exempt from the stormwater management ordinance's requirements. The reason why they are exempt is because the stormwater management does not apply and the citation is in the memorandum um, we also have, I printed out copies, hard copies of the stormwater management ordinance for each member of the board and the appellants as well, if you deign to look at it. But the stormwater management ordinance will not apply to development unless there has been 5,000 square feet of cumulative development on that property since July 1st, 2001. Anything that existed on that property prior to that date is, for lack of a better word, grandfathered in and does not count towards that disturbance. You can only start to begin applying the stormwater management ordinance or conducting that stormwater review once you cross over that 5,000 cumulative square feet of either pre-existing or either development that's already been approved since 2001 or that will be approved with the application of this permit. And you do not come close from the review staff conducted, and by all appearances, it appears a righteous conclusion Luggum came to, uh, that cumulative disturbance is not hit here. That, in fact, was about the only thing we got out of the zoning approval, that we now have a site plan that establishes this adds, I think, 364 square feet of cumulative disturbance, and that goes in the ledger of cumulative disturbance that will be counted against this property going forward for future development. The only other project it looked like has happened in the past 23 years is that the uh, driveway on the appellant's property appears from aerial photographs to have been filled in sometime in the mid-2000s. Uh, measurements on GIS, which we could check in real time using those aerials if the board so deigns, looks like it only comes out to about 1,100 square feet of cumulative disturbance. So in total, it's about 1,500 of cumulative disturbance, well short of the limit that would trigger application of the stormwater management ordinance. Now, the law that appellants have talked to you about today is Maryland's, it's, they're correctly terming it the civil law. And what that law is, is a court-derived doctrine. It does not come out of local codes. It does not come out of the Maryland Annotated Code. It does not come out of Comar. And all those sources, the phrase natural flow appears not once in our comprehensive zoning ordinance. It appears once in the entire Maryland Annotated Code in a section that talks about dams across quote unquote wild and scenic rivers. And it appears thrice in all of Comar, once more about the scenic rivers, once about artificial dams, and once about white uh, water fishing vessels and certification thereof, which I do not think is applicable to this case. Where the laws do come out from is again that long body, that very protracted body of case law. And that is not about local ordinance. It is not about local regulations. The only relevance and saliency that rule has is in helping a court adjudicate disputes between private property owners when their property rights are in conflict with one another and they cannot decide between themselves how to solve them and must seek judicial intervention. And you've heard that kind of referenced and hinted at tonight already where both sides are asserting that they have a right to defend their property, which they do, and that both sides are asserting that, you know, it's reasonable or unreasonable to force me to make my act or take this particular action. Um, and it's also important to note, though, I hesitate to go down this route because I do not think it is proper for this board to ask or really inquire whether it's fair or just or appropriate. For Mr. Ortiz, for Mr. Ortiz to install this improvement to the detriment of his neighbors, because it is not an inquiry that we were allowed to make by the Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance, and you have no greater powers or ability to solve this problem than Land Use and Growth Management had. 
But because in my history of this board and because you've seen the pictures, the Katzenbergers obviously feel that they are wronged. And there's certainly enough there to make one think and wonder about what is going on there. I expect the board will inquire. I'll also note that the articulation of the civil law that was given is significantly incomplete. Uh, while it is true that there's a general, that the general rule is that the lower situated property must accept the natural flow of water from the higher property and that you cannot materially alter that natural flow of water to the detriment of your neighbor. And that includes both stopping it from coming on to the lower lying land or accelerate or adding to the volume coming to it when coming from the higher land, situated land. Maryland law has also consistently always stood by the principle of that that rule is always tempered by what it refers to as the reasonableness of use test, which is, as courts explain, a balancing test where a judge or a jury, as may be appropriate for the case, have to look at the harms and the benefits to both property and fashion relief accordingly. That the, Though it is the general rule, it is not an absolute rule, and that it does require a fact-specific inquiry to fashion relief as may be appropriate and necessary for that case. But again, it is important to emphasize and to reiterate that the body that does that balancing test, the body that decides whether that rule applies at all, is a court. It is not the Board of Appeals, and it is not an administrative agency. There's case law noted in the ordinance that says that um, private nuisance, private claims of action, which is basically what this is as a heart of it, is the Katzenbergers coming before you and claiming that they possess, as they do, certain rights in their property, a certain guarantee that they should be allowed to make reasonable use and enjoyment of their property and not have that unreasonably interfered with by the actions of their neighbor. That private right exists. It is something a court would recognize, but it's not something that enters into permitting. It's not something that enters into the analysis of whether or not to approve this permit. The uh, permitting is simply a search for whether does it conform to the regulations and the requirements of our local law and our comprehensive zoning ordinance and our stormwater management ordinance if they are applicable. If you fit the criteria the CZO gets you, the CZO stipulates that you shall be given that permit. There's no room here for the director in a situation where you are permitted by right, where you don't have to go through public hearing, where you don't have other standards to meet, to sit back, scratch your head, and say, well, is this really the best outcome? Should it be different? And though I get it, those cases are difficult, those cases are hard, and it can feel harsh and cold. The alternative is local government ruled by basically our switching notions of what counts for fundamental fairness, and that is one step shy and very often becomes arbitrariness and capriciousness, which is about the one thing a circuit court can be guaranteed to find fault in a decision of an administrative agency if it's ever turned back on appeal. I do not think there is anything for the Board of Appeals to do for the Katzenbergers tonight. I do not think there is anything you can do for the Katzenbergers tonight. My hope was that Mr. Ortiz would be here, because then I could remark that $931.58, what's unfortunate has to be spent, is money well spent if it was enough to put Mr. Ortiz on notice that there are at least facts here that would make someone look at it and wonder, and that if he would sit down, talk to the Katzenbergers, and try to realize there might be a problem or figure out ways about it, it would be to everybody's benefit to keep this out of court. But that is the only body that can grant the Katzenbergers the relief they are seeking, not this Board of Appeals. For the board members who are returning about a year and a half, two years ago, we had a case where a lady in St. Clement's Shores appealed a neighbor who wanted to construct a, build, a garage that was going across the street from her. Uh, we issued a building permit that was appealed. She had a litany of reasons. She put a lot of research into it. She spent a lot of time on it. But at the end of the day, what it came down to was did that garage fit the criteria for the building permit? Did it fit all the standards it had to meet, or did it not? You've got a similar case here where there's obviously more going on here, or there may be more going on here, or it appears there could be more going on here, but there simply is no room or latitude in the, in the board's jurisdiction to permit it to ask these questions or to fashion this kind of relief. Now, 
that wasn't so much of a brief summary of the memo. I think probably if we wrote it down, that was longer than the memorandum itself. I don't have any further things I would like to address the board about or speak. We do have Mr. Goldsmith present. I know there are um, questions I'm sure the board has for him. He's happy to come up here and answer them. We have Ms. Andritz as well for anything that might overlap. And of course, any questions the board has that I could answer, I'm happy to do so. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hauser. Do we have any questions from Mr. Hauser before we move on to? I do. So you mentioned that there's no law or procedure or CZO, but what about internal policy within Lugum itself, <clears throat> specifically regarding communication among staff members about situations for permits that are up and coming? Is there questions? No, I do have questions about that. How about that process? Can you describe that? Because our applicant went several times and lodged complaints and said their specific reason for that complaint. So what happened inside of Lugum that allowed that messaging to either be lost or not put in the proper hands where somebody could at least have answered their questions? It took them several times to get a response, and by then the permit was issued. I so the timeline there, so what about that? Policy improvement, procedural errors? Mr. Bradley, I think um, if we ask Mr. Hauser to answer it, it's, it's more of a testimony than a statement that he needs to give for the county. So I think we need to ask that of the uh, director of Lugum. Okay. Okay. But if you hold the question for that, for um, um, To add to director. then let me make it the question for the lawyer. If we find errors in that procedure or policy, does that have weight in this case? In my opinion, it does not. Um, procedural, if there was inconvenience, if there was frustration, does not change Mr. Ortiz's substantive right in the issuance of a permit he is entitled to receive if he fits the criteria. Because again, remember that it's not just a question of the Katzenberger's rights as well. The property owner has rights as well. Just because you feel, if the board would feel that a process could have been improved, perhaps that the Katzenbergers do have frustrations with the process or that better communication could have prevented all of this, uh, that still does not alter and it cannot be a detriment to the property owner and the rights they possess in their property and the right they have to the issuance of that permit if they hit the marks for issuance of the permit. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions for Mr. Hauser? Right, Ms. Hauser, you can state it if you want. I would like to call um, Ms. Andrens, Andritz, and uh, Mr. Goldsmith up, please. And for the record, in all clarity, Mr. Goldsmith's my neighbor. So I just want that known on the board. Okay, that's fine. Have a seat, please. Oh, before you sit down, let me get you sworn in, please. Um, do you declare and affirm under the penalty of perjury that the testimonies, responses, and statements you may give will be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Ms. Andrews, we'll start with you for the record. If you would give us your name and your title and your address, please. Absolutely. Um, my name is Jessica Andritz, and I'm the Director of Land Youths and Growth Management. Um, our office is located at 23150 Leonard Hall Drive here in Leonardtown. Thank you. My name is Joe Goldsmith. I'm the Zoning Compliance Supervisor for the Department of Land Use and Growth Management. Okay, great. Thank you. Now, Mr. Bradley, you had a question. We'll so start with you first. My, my question is uh, the applicant um, called several times and told the reason why they were uh, fighting the permit that was going to be given or trying to give more information into the permit, saying that it was a stormwater and drainage problem. Then the permit was issued, and it still took them a while to find out any updates or information. So was their concern a consideration as part of that permit process? Was that communicated amongst members in the agency? Um, can you give us any amplifying information on that? Um, so I will say under normal circumstances, um, when 
complaints or questions come to our department about, um, I'm going to say situations like this where there's flooding or maybe there's a structure that's been built, shows up kind of overnight and people wonder, did they have a permit? Did the county approve that? Right, those kinds of questions would normally go to our inspections division and, and Joe is the, the head of that division. Under normal circumstances, um, notes would be placed into a computer system. And I do believe that the permits um, specialists, the technicians um, up front that would take in, we'll call it after the fact permits, mm -hmm. um, would have that information available and certainly would consult um, that information. And if other internal discussions need to be had, they generally would be. Um, as far as what exactly transpired, um, specific conversations, I'm not aware. I don't know if Joe is aware I, of what- I, I could expound on okay, that. Okay, so if I may. <clears throat> so um, on the 13th of December, I received a call from Mr. Katzenberger in reference to the trenching on Mr. Ortiz's property. Um, I contacted my inspector uh, to go out and take a look. Inspector Owens went out, saw active trenching, laying a block. And because we didn't have an active permit on file, I told him to go ahead and place a stop work order on the property until we determined the scope of this project. Once it reached to a certain level, then it would be more problematic. So we stopped it initially. We told the, the landscaper to obtain a permit they came in that afternoon and applied. And by the next morning, a permit was issued. And Mr. Katzenberger, so permit was issued. Mr. Ortiz was advised that he could remove the stock work order and, con and continue working, which he did. Then the next day, Mr. Katzenberger had contacted um, I believe by Thursday evening, he contacted Inspector Owen and voiced his displeasure and indicated that he wanted to appeal. So by Friday afternoon, I had sent him the form to appeal um, the permit. So all that had transpired within 48 hours. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And then talking about, does Mr. Young work for you? Mr. Young does not. He works for the St. Mary's County Soil, Soil Conservation, Conservation District. District. Um, okay. Yeah. So but, can the county speak to anything that he may have said or Lugum speak to anything he may have said to Mr. Ortiz about what improvements needed to be made? If I could conduct a brief direct examination of Mr. Goldsmith, I think I might be able to expound on that. Sure, go ahead. Answer it. So, Mr. Goldsmith, did you personally ever make a visit out to 22986 Shady Grove Drive? I did. About what day was that, if you recall exactly? January the 26th. Who was present with you? Uh, Mr. Ortiz, Inspector Owen, and um, Bruce Young from the Soil Conservation District. About how long were you all out there? Can I ask you to speak into the mic or pull the mic closer to you? Okay. Yep. Uh, we were out there uh, probably 45 minutes. And um, I'll ask you, noting again that this would likely be hearsay. We do have some relaxed rules of evidence, and it's at the discretion of the board whether or not to receive it. But I note that for the Katzenberger's benefit. Uh, what did Mr. Bruce, if anything, did Mr. Young say when you made that site visit? Well, the purpose of Mr. Young's, I, I invited him out to the property, to Mr. Ortiz's property, to get his expert opinion on possible solutions for the wall. And... Um, Mr. Young basically said that, okay, there's, there's water that's being redirected, but in his opinion, the water would follow to the rear of the garage and continue on its course. Um, and that any standing water because of the sandy soil would be absorbed. Um, with the conversation with Mr. Ortiz and Mr. Young, as far as the ponding water on, on Mr. Ortiz's side, he recommended maybe Mr. Ortiz putting a trench on his side. And if there was a problem with standing water on Mr. Katzenberger's side, that um, putting a pinch uh, hole in the wall to allow that water to 
enter the trench along Mr. Ortiz's property to drain. Hi, Mr. Goldsmith, you mentioned Mr. Young's quote unquote expertise was the word you used. Um, what does Mr. Young, what's his job? Uh, he's uh, the director of um, the Soil Conservation District. And could you explain what the Soil Conservation District does for um, those members of the board or members of the audience who may not be familiar? Uh, basically sediment and erosion control. All right. If that's it, the board has other questions. None. I do. Um, this project, was it large enough to have conversations with other jurisdictions like Mr. Young or the health department or other ones that you would normally go to for a permit? Is, was this project large enough to do that? I, I can't speak on behalf of the permit side. Um, there are certain criteria that they have to meet before they issue a permit. And I did have a conversation with the permit manager specifically about this case, and they were compelled to issue the permit. Okay. If I could take note of the, um, CZO, if it falls within that exemption of the no more than 5,000 cumulative. Well, that's, what, that's where I was going, right. okay. If and it were this, above that, for re it would be triggered to go to Soil Conservation District. Is that's my that's where I was going, and right. my next question was, if it's that way, if that's a fact, is this normal practice every day? No. That you would, this, this permit that was issued was less than 400 square foot, I think is what it is. Yes, if it was larger, if the project was larger than that, it would certainly go to others for review. Understood, okay, so but because it was so, such a small project, it stayed within house, per se. It would be exempt, yes. Okay, and that's a normal practice. Yes. For land use and growth management. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. Was the, um, the contractor also there when you met with Bruce Young and Mr. Ortiz? Tease? I do not know. I, there, was, there was another individual there. I don't know how he was affiliated with Mr. Ortiz. But he did not offer his opinion or any advice. Uh, while he was there. Okay. Mr. Richardson, go ahead. Sir, you heard my question earlier on what side of the wall will that drainage pipe be on? Uh, in your expertise, does it matter which side of the wall that drainage pipe would be on? Wouldn't it still go the same direction? Well, Mr. Young's opinion was is that the water would channel to the rear of Mr. Ortiz's garage. And I believe that would be regardless of which side the pipe would be placed on. So it's really not drained anywhere then? It, it will go to the rear of Ms. Ortiz's garage. I, I can't hear you. I'm a little hard to it, hear. It would go to the rear of Mr. Ortiz's garage, uh, regardless of which side of the wall. So it's really not a drainage pipe then? Well, I guess Mr. Young's uh, impression of the wall, um, as he described the water coming down, he, he related that the, the leaves along Mr. Katzenberg's fence would certainly prohibit the water from moving freely along that wall to the rear of Mr. Ortiz's garage. So that, uh, without offering any solutions, that was one issue that he thought would be problematic. Okay, in, in your opinion, would it matter which side of the, which side of the wall the drainage pipe would be? I, I would say that both sides are getting a, a yeah, certain but, volume of but, water. But before my, before my witness answers, I'll remind him that if he doesn't feel that he has the professional knowledge or isn't comfortable rendering an opinion, that's the correct answer to give. Then I, I would say I'm not qualified to <laughs> render that opinion. <laughs> that, would, that would be a question for Mr. Young. <laughs> and then you'd leave me no course to so I'm the most qualified then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do have one other question. Uh, after the project was finished, did you – or any of your staff go back out and inspect the work after it was completed? The, there's presently a stop work order in place pending the outcome of the appeal. Uh, there'll be a discussion I'll have with Mr. Hauser later at, at what point we would uh, lift that. So if Mr. Young recommended a hole or something placed into the wall to allow drainage, would that have any bearing on 
this project moving forward after the stop work work, work order was lifted? Could that be made part of a content allowing them to continue work? Because you said he. I'll say if they ask my opinion on whether that is something they could do, I'd say no. The way I see it, that Mr. Ortiz, rightly, wrongly, or differently, is entitled to issuance of this permit because mm -hmm. our local law just does not extend that far. And that if we tried to place conditions on that permit that he is entitled to from the permitting perspective, we'd be operating outside our proper powers. Um, I get it. I understand it. You want to we are not indifferent to it either. We see a problem like to help. We have to be conscious that we only exercise those powers to which we are given. If we're going to fashion extraordinary relief to vitiate uh, the private property rights, the only way you could do that, or the only way we could do that is that we had something in our law that gives us discretion to do so, and we do not. The only way to get a condition like that binding is for a court to order it. Well, I still have to ask the questions because the witness did say that Mr. Young recommended for drainage that a hole could be put, uh, put into the wall as one of the solutions. So that leads us down that question of since the, sorry for my poor eyesight, since St. Mary's Soil Conservation District manager made that recommendation, does that have weight and bearing since a stop work order is already issued? He has come out and said, put a hole in the wall. How much weight does that I, have? Mr. Mr. House, I think we would need Mr. Scott to answer this one, okay? I think. Okay. Not, not to cut you off, but I think Mr. Yeah. Scott should answer that one for the board. Okay, so if I understand the question correctly, I guess you're asking whether or not the county can place a condition on lifting the stop work order. Correct. Um. My answer would be no, and my understanding of the situation is the stop work order was issued solely because of the appeal of the permit. And to facilitate a status quo, uh, because the appeal was coming to this board. And so the stop work order wasn't issued because of any actual or perceived violation of code or, or regulation or ordinance. And I think that, um, the as as unfortunate as it may be in this situation um there does not appear to be a remedy in our comprehensive zoning ordinance mm -hmm. for this particular issue um and i think you know this board as much power as this board has in certain circumstances it only derives its power from the comprehensive zoning ordinance and so the real question for us is was the issuance of the permit consistent with the terms of the ordinance okay thank you appreciate it okay no more questions anyone else have any questions okay we'll open up a public comment now Did you mr chair uh, i'd ask if um the appellants have any questions for these witnesses Yes. Come to the microphone, if you would, please. I got just a couple questions and stuff. Okay. When Mr. Moody stopped him from answering that question, said that he does, he's not qualified to answer that question. Okay. If he's not qualified to answer that question, how is he qualified to issue a permit? You know what I'm saying? Okay, number two, um, can you give me the definition of a retaining wall? Can you give me one minute? Okay, we'll move. Oh, you think well, about that. I'll move on to something else. I got another. Now I can, I can answer that one more then. How we would define retaining walls. The first place to look is to see if it's not if it is an enumerated term in the comprehensive zoning ordinance, which I've got, that's the black binder right there. That's a quick inquiry to make. I just have to get up to do it. If it is not an enumerated term in the comprehensive zoning ordinance, then the definition it's going to have is going to be its ordinary dictionary definition. Okay, that would be. which is, 
what is the purpose of a retaining wall? Let's put it that way. Is to retain, retain, let's say, soil or whatever to, to, to hold it up, right? All right. Okay. I can go along with that. Well, what do you think that a, re a retaining wall is doing when they know that there's a stormwater issue? So, okay. It's a stormwater yeah. issue. It's not a retaining wall issue. It is the stormwater, and that's why I put in appeal, and that's why I call Lugum complaining about it. It is a stormwater issue, and I repeated it numerous times, okay? And I also put it online, and I could not find it afterwards, but yet I spoke to the county about it, okay? Now, let me get to another situation. You said that you, you or Mr. Goldsmith had took... Uh, the soil guy out there and all that. But that's transpired the week after, right? Yes. Okay. The wall was completed, correct? Yes. Okay. With the exception of the fence on top. Can correct. I, okay. I, I hate to interrupt it, but you, so we can get it on record, I need you all to, when you answer, talking to these mics, if you would, please. Yeah. Okay. Oh, sure. So anyway, that that's happened the net following week. So the wall, was, the wall was already completed. So what is the soil conservation guy what, what is that going to do? Um, basically, the purpose of me calling him out there was just to try to uh, come up with a solution for neighbors. Okay. Why couldn't we have done this during uh, the application process? Because it's not required as part of the application okay. process. Now, just common sense is, okay, common sense, which, okay, Yes, I understand that you're not required, okay? That's for a retaining wall. But when I called and complained about it, I called it a dam, okay? That's not a retaining wall. If you pull up the definition of a dam, that's blocking water, okay? My complaint was that. So that should have stopped the whole process right there. And I even told them that I had issued a thing with the county already, okay? And the, the 311 line or whatever it is, and I filed a, 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 a thing before this even transpired. Okay, now, uh, can I get you to pull up uh, one of the early pictures, or ones where I'm kind of standing around the water? Uh, down farther. <coughs> uh, I think there's one more that's the other direction. One more. Uh, I think there was one of me standing yeah, during, during, uh, during, construction. during construction. Okay, yeah, back up one. Okay, here's the situation. Okay, the water's sitting in that area. Okay, to get it to, out of that low lying area, it has to go uphill. Down past me on the other side, that elevation goes up this high. Okay. So how can that water go out and around that wall until it gets over that elevation? So I think the answer again is that the comprehensive zoning ordinance and the stormwater management ordinance does not require explanations or answers to these questions as a predicate for issuance of the permit okay, okay. because the review I isn't required. I understand required. what you're saying. Right. Okay. All right. My question is to Mr. Goldsmith. Knowing that there was a problem, knowing that it was a stormwater issue, and knowing all of these problems, why did not stop and review the situation? I basically don't have the authority to stop Mr. Ortiz's project. Okay, who does? Okay, that's why I, you know, that's why I called you guys, okay? Well, you had the authority to stop in the first time, okay? Why wasn't that stop work? stayed in place until this whole situation was resolved. Now, who, it's something who's, I can take note of without testimony. So there are really two stop work or order moments here. The first came on December 13th when a complaint was received that work was being undertaken without a permit. That stop work order was posted that day. A permit was granted. That first stop work order subsequently lifted. The second stop work order came when an appeal was noted because it is a provision of the Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance that noting an appeal, whatever its merits, 
operates as a stay of all further proceedings in furtherance of the issue appeal. The only way to lift that stop work order is had Mr. Ortiz claimed that failure to lift the stop work order would have been an imminent danger to life or property. He made no such claim. Therefore, stop work order stays during the pendency of this appeal. See, the, th see the thing is, by issuing a stop work uh, appeal, okay, that takes time. He had it done within one day. He had so many people out there working on it. He had it done within uh, one day, uh, two days. So but if you guys, if Lugum would have followed, you know, took, let's put it this way. If Lugum would have taken consideration of the complaints of the surrounding neighborhood, took that into consideration, done it, uh, performed an investigation, we wouldn't have even been here because the wall, went, well, the wall was only half done. We wouldn't even be here. So if Lugum would have paid attention to the complaints and the former complaints, we wouldn't even hear it. That's all I have to say. Is it, any more questions for me? Anyone else have any questions for Mr. Katzenberg? No, sir. Okay. John, you have any? I mean, Mr. Howes, you have any? No, sir. Okay. Mr. Vaughn? I just had one question about uh, the site plan procedure. Um, what's the requirements for- yeah, Mr. Vaughn, you're gonna to have to speak up. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, what's the requirements for um, preparing a site plan? Um, is topography required? Uh, typically when, even if it is a exempt uh, stormwater management plan, when we prepare a plan, um, topography is required and in this particular case, that would have, uh, I believe, had a, a great help, you know, knowing that the wall is blocking the uh, low portion of the property. I'd have to go back and um, check, because the only way I'm going to answer that is I think how something like this is processed at land use and growth management is it would come in as an accessory to the principal use. And I have to go back and look at the standards to see whether accessory uses require permit approval or site plan approval. And I'm pretty sure it's permit approval, but I don't know that for sure without, again, checking the black binder. Um, I'll be candid. When I saw that a site plan was required at all, it took me aback a bit because I wasn't sure if there was even a requirement we require that much. Again, the only thing that we really get out of that site plan, the only real contribution it makes to the furtherance of our work is it accounts and it keeps a ledger of the cumulative disturbance so we can figure out when that 5,000 square foot limit is reached. I'm not aware of any requirement that we would have to issue topography or that requiring would be relevant to this case. I understand it's relevant to the factual issue and the dispute the Katzenbergers had with their neighbor, but it's not necessary for the question of whether Mr. Ortiz was entitled to a permit. Right. Okay. Right. Thank you, Mr. Vaughn. Anything, any other questions right this minute? No, sir. Mr. Gotch, you want to come up? I know you had wanted to speak this evening. And, uh, Do you declare and affirm under the penalty of perjury that the testimony, responses, and statements you may give will be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. And for the record, if you would, please. Jim Gotch, Director of Public Works and Transportation, 44825 St. Andrews Church Lane Road, whatever we are at, <laughs> California. Okay. Um, I'm not going to get a Christmas card from Mr. Hauser on this one. Uh, so this is going to be long-winded, but bear with me because there is a mistake. Um, first off, I, I need to tell you that I, I know the Katzenbergers. I know a lot of people in this county. I do know the Katzenbergers personally. Uh, so I'm not trying to give you anything on their behalf. I'm just trying to tell you what the law what we follow for public works, grading, and all that. So the ordinance is not the stormwater ordinance. The ordinance is the St. Mary's County Stormwater Management Grading, Erosion, and Sediment Control Ordinance. Do you have a copy that we can give to the Katzenbergs? 
and does the board would, would the board like a copy? I would please. Please. And for the board. These please. these are your copies actually. Uh, okay. John. Paper, paper order. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. That's okay. The next one, yeah. Did you want yeah. one? Yeah. We got one. Mr. Hell, do we have one? Okay, so so what I'll tell you is I, I started land development engineering in nineteen eighty four. So I'm at forty years experience. The the law has been the same then as it is today. You cannot flood an a, a, a upstream property owner's property without getting a drainage easement. And so I think what the conundrum we're in, um, five, ten years ago, we tried to streamline the ordinance. We had a delegation, We, when I say we, the county, uh, we had a delegation go down to Huntsville because of the BRAC. We want the Navy base in the county. So uh, we were trying to figure out ways to streamline the development process. And I think that's why we're here today because we have agencies like Public Works is not involved in the review of a, of a building permit for a retaining wall. But the, but the problem comes in when you block drainage flow so you've heard some some of the some of the law about the civil rule law in the in in Maryland. So that basically says an, a downstream property owner can't block the flow of an upstream property owner. If it's a natural drainage swale, you you cannot cut off the water. Basically, what you're doing is creating a pond on somebody else's property. And that's the mistake that's happening here. We haven't looked at that. Um, and then there's a second law, which Maryland doesn't follow, which is the common rule law. And so the common rule common law- Common enemy law. Okay. And so the common law is the water is viewed as the enemy. And so the two property owners try to figure out a way to solve the problem of the common enemy. So what you would do is, there's been a lot of talk about a, a drainage pipe. You would have a pipe that carries the water from the upstream side of the wall down to the, wherever it has to outfall. If it's over at Shady Mile Drive in the ditch, you know, so be it. If you want to, as the lower property owner, build a wall and block the flow, you have to do something to control the water upstream of the wall, or you have to get an easement from the owner for any increase from the upstream owner for any increase in the water elevation. And, and I think what Mr. Hauser was arguing is because the wall is less than 5,000 square feet of disturbance, it doesn't need a grading permit. So it's exempt from the grading ordinance and exempt from the stormwater ordinance. We had a case, it didn't make it to the Board of Appeals. It was uh, cut off at Lugham. It was very similar, there, in, but it, the difference is it wasn't a wall. Uh, and, and that's how it was stopped, was uh, uh, in the north end of the county, the lower property owner built a dam, so earthwork across the swale. Same thing as what's happening here, but it was done with, with dirt instead of a concrete block wall. He was required to remove the wall because he's ponding water on the upstream property owner. And he was required to remove the wall at his own expense. And it was the same issue. Went out there, did the work, no permit, stop work order, and then he was re uh, required to remove the wall. So uh, I'm looking at a case that was in, uh, I can give you the name. It's uh, 
civil law rule as applied in Maryland, Bishop versus, uh, v. Richard, Bieberman v. Funkhauser. But, but it says in here, when it, when it becomes necessary to create an embankment for any purpose, it is the duty of the lower proprietor to provide an outlet of ample capacity to carry off the flow of the water. Mr. Koch, was that a, a court case? Yes. As a court of appeals opinion. Bieberman but, v. But that's above us. That's above us. We're not, we're not the yeah. court, okay? And, and I understand that. I'm, okay. I'm just saying, in 40 years, if you block the flow, you have to go get an easement. So when you develop a piece of property, if you put fill on your property, you have to provide some sort of drainage area or drainage system to collect the water and take it off site without increasing the water on somebody else's property. Because what in effect you're doing is creating a dam and a stormwater management pond on someone else's property. And you cannot create a pond on someone else's property. Sir, I, I got the same I, question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm okay. I still have the same question. If the drainage pipe works on one side of the wall, why doesn't it work on the other side of the wall? I, I can I, explain that for you. Sir? I can explain that for you. So, the water flows from Woodlawn. If you drive, do you know where we're talking about? The Shady Mile, the entrance to where the Cracker Barrel and all those restaurants, Olive Garden. So when you're on Shady Mile, that's the low spot. Woodlawn, Woodlawn Drive is higher. Yeah. So Woodlawn Drive flows downhill through the Ortiz property to Shady Mile. So if you put a drainage system it doesn't matter what side of the wall it's on as long as the water gets to the inlet, but the pipe has to go through the Ortiz property to get to the ditch in Shady Mile. Remember where, he, where they showed the contours earlier and they followed that one contour down and went down uh, across in front of the shed, the garage? It has to, it has to go through what Mr. Gotch is saying, it has to go through the Ortiz's property to get a natural flow down to that ditch. Okay, so the drainage, I understand. So it's not going along, the drainage pipe is not going along the wall. It's going through the man's property. You have to. So, Thank you for the so, answer to the question, sir. Because I understand it, so, but so I, I just think, couldn't get understand why you had a pipe on one side and a pipe on the other side, why it wasn't the same. So thank you. I, I think where we're at is a technicality. So If you were going to build a retaining wall on your property, there's no problem. And I don't think I heard the Katzenberger say there's no problem with that. But you cannot block flow from one property to the other. It's against the state law. And are, are we going to say, well, it's not written. Everything in Comar is not also included in our zoning ordinance, so we can ignore Comar. No, we can't do that. So... If it's against the law in the state of Maryland to block the flow, it's against the law in St. Mary's County to block the flow. And that's exactly what has happened. And so they've created a dam. Mr. Katzenberger is exactly right. They've created a dam and created a pond on the Katzenberger property behind the wall. Friendly cross-examination for my witness. Absolutely. And I'll note, too, this is the only time in two and a half years I have gotten Mr. Gotch to yell at me when we first talked about this case. <laughs> uh, Mr. Gotch, I want to start off first. The development you're referencing in the north end of the county where you required a drainage easement. Yes. How big of a project was that? What oh, was very it? similar. Very similar in size. This predates my involvement at Public Works. Had so this is about 2016. Was there 5,000 square feet of cumulative disturbance on that property? No. What brought it in front of you then? How did you all get involved? It was, he, here's, hey, I got to go backwards again. So, so we streamlined the ordinance. Public Works is no longer involved in the review of these type of things. Mm -hmm. We used to be involved in the review of these type of things, but we're not because what does Public Works need to worry about a wall? 
the construction of a retaining wall. We don't, except for when it blocks drainage. So when it blocked drainage, when an embankment was built, again, it's a building a stormwater pond on the upstream property owner's property. So public works would have been called in because that really looks like a stormwater management pond. It's got a stormwater pond embankment built across the swale. So I'm still, what's puzzling me is what's the mechanism? Under what theory did you all require the county action? What invoked our ability to use our police power? It would have been building a, blocking a flow of a drainage swale, building a stormwater pond on somebody else's property. Okay. Passing you then, or putting it in between us here to my copy of, as you correctly note, the stormwater management, erosion, con right, sediment control. So we're on page 38, section 4.3.2. Uh, notes the following activities are exempt from the requirement to prepare a sediment and erosion control pan. Clearing and or grading activities that disturb less than 5,000 square feet of land area and disturb less than 100 cubic yards of earth. Either of those present in this case that you know of from what you've been able to see tonight? The answer is no. We used to use common sense. Okay. Then turning to page, give me one moment, 42, 4.6 grading permit requirements. Give me a moment to find my place again. Uh, Point one. Would, yeah, it, well, Again, we agree that grading permits not required if exempt from the requirement to prepare a sediment and erosion control plan pursuant to section 4.3 of the ordinance. Okay. Show me in the ordinance where you're allowed to build a pond on somebody else's property. So there is a site to 2007 case from Evans v. Burris, Court of Appeals opinion, where they noted that private nuisance generally operates independently of permitting. And that, again, if a permit fits the requirements that are provided for in local law and ordinances, you are entitled to issuance of that permit. Doing so does not defeat your right to bring an action in private nuisance. It does not obviate a property owner from going to the court, but it does not give just because a court may find in favor of the applicant when they assert a private right. It does not give Lugum, DPW, or the Board of Appeals the right to play judge. Jurisdiction is not a technicality. Jurisdiction is an integral, important, fundamental part of the law because there are certain inquiries appropriate for an administrative agency. There are certain inquiries not. When we talk about the natural flow of water, understand there are a lot of ordinances, a lot of regulations developed in light of that. If our stormwater ordinance did in fact apply to this case, there would have probably been a different outcome in that permitting. But it does not, and I do not see an element of the law that does apply it. Again, besides, there is a rule that a court will have to apply if this case comes before him, but that rule is the court's to apply, not ours. Can I ask a question? Yes. Our statement. So it says under the uh, section R105 permits, it says about the retaining walls that are not over four feet. Okay. But the definition of a retaining wall is to keep the land behind it from sliding. Or they had from, that was from Webster, other ones, a structure that holds or retains soil behind it. So does that wall, the cement blocks that were put up, is that really considered a retaining wall or what other definition would that fall under? So if it's coming from the IRC, was the quote, um, if it's coming from the IRC, the International Residential Code, that's going to be the building code and would only basically trigger a building permit inspection. Off the top of my head, not a building code official, don't know what else might be in there. But again, isn't going to trigger. Mr. Hauser, can you speak up just hard, a tad? Isn't going to trigger application of the stormwater management ordinance or the grading ordinance or sediment control ordinance. Again, the only thing that is going to activate that ordinance and give us some discretion here is 5,000 square feet of cumulative disturbance. Hmm. So once again, okay, if is that considered a retaining wall? And if it's not, what would that be considered? Stormwater management embankment. Mm. 
what I'm doing now for the edification of others is I am going through the back of the. I didn't. Um, <clears throat> I didn't see retaining wall defined. Uh, you can verify that. I did see fence de defined in our CZO, uh, but the definition of, of fence makes it clear that a retaining wall is not a fence. Yeah. It just doesn't doesn't define retaining wall. Neither is it a structure the per for the purposes of the comprehensive zoning ordinance. That also, by definition, excludes fences or retaining walls. And again, if I'm going to go through that definition, I'd have to go upstairs and pull the IRC where it would be defined. But again, I don't think, regardless of what we call it, the only thing that's going to trigger the stormwater management ordinance is, again, whatever development is going on there is at 5,000 square feet of cumulative disturbance or more. Okay, and I understand what yeah. you're saying. But I guess where I'm coming from is I want to make sure that, okay, it didn't trigger anything for LAGAM, it did, and, I, and I understand all that too. But if we are going over the building codes where it says fences, and it also you have in there about the retaining wall, but a retaining wall is to hold soil, stones, or some kind of structure back like that, um, but this is not what that is doing. It says it's it's holding or retained soil behind it, or that that's the one definition. The Merriam-Webster is a wall that is built to keep the land behind it from sliding. So. Is Mr. Ortiz, did he build that to keep land or some kind of soil from coming down? Okay. Yeah. So that is what, from what I understand, that is what the permit was based upon to, um, you know, it didn't trigger anything big because it wasn't over 5,100 square feet. But is there another area in the ordinances that would really better define what that wall is? So, so if Mr. Ortiz put on the permit that he was retaining water, then this would not be a retaining wall. It would be a dam is what you're saying. Correct. And again... Not sure that's the conclusion we get to because I don't think dam is defined either. And again, reiterate, the only thing that requires us in my read, and Jim, I know you just mentioned Comar. Do you have a site to give me that I could go back and check and double check myself on this one? Uh, no, not off the top of my head. Okay. But, uh, uh, you know, if you build a stormwater pond, a lot of small ponds, you don't build, you have an earth embankment, but the overflow weir is a poured retaining wall. So building a stormwater pond on a piece of property, a lot of times, instead of building a big riser, big concrete inlet with a pipe outfall, you just build a retaining wall. So that's exactly what has been built here. The retaining wall is acting as the stormwater management embankment. Okay. So, I, I, I mean, we, we, we're beating this dead horse, okay? Um, the appeal is that they put up this concrete, they never, it, it's not called a retaining wall, and the appeal is called a concrete with block, okay? They run down his property line, Ortiz's property line, and the um, Kassenbergs didn't like what it did because it, it we saw that there was water left on their property, but we saw there was water left on their property before the wall even went up. So our charge tonight is whether the inspector or land use and growth management director erred, erred in judgment on issuing this permit. Sure. So, so then please tell me where you think that happened, so we can move on. Because he's building a pond without a permit. That's not what he's built. He built a retaining wall with a permit. So my, my, my question from this board to you, Mr. Hauser, 
the Kassenbergs, anybody can answer this question, taking feelings aside, taking results aside, okay, was this wall permitted correctly in accordance with our zoning ordinance? That's the question to you. Was it permitted? If you were the permitting outfit for land use and growth management, and Would you Mr. Like Ortez my... came to you and said, I, want to, I need to do a permit because I started this wall, and I'm sorry it's after the fact, but I want to continue my wall. Would you like to hear my email to Lugum? Yeah, I would like for you to answer my question first. Did, could they build a retaining wall per the zoning ordinance? Yes. Was it built incorrectly? Yes. No, I, that's, that's not the appeal. Okay? The appeal is, did land use and growth management err in the issuance of a building permit, of a, of a permit? whether it's building or whatever it may be, okay? Did they err in judgment in giving this people, this man, Ortez, a permit? And your answer is? Yes. I, I won't change that answer. Okay, you then can, tell me, tell then, me, then tell me and tell this board how you believe that land use and growth management erred in their judgment to issue a permit. Because, because you need to look. Within you between now and 10 o'clock, okay? Because we're closing at 10 o'clock. Okay. No, I'm just, I'm just, I know be it's, been, it's been drawn out. It's been, and I appreciate it. And I, and I want to hear everybody's opinion on this. Okay. But we we continue to beat this horse. Okay. I need to put a saddle on him. Okay. Okay. So you can build a retaining wall, but you can't block water. And so when you block the water, you're no longer building a retaining wall for the purpose of a retaining wall. You're building a retaining wall for the purpose of creating a stormwater management embankment. I, I, That's I, the I, error. I understand that, okay. How do I, how do I ask this question? Um, geez. <clears throat> Mr. Ortez built the wall to, I can't, I can't, talk for him because I, so I won't but what I see here on the presentations tonight from from the county and from the Katzenbergs is that wall went down the, the property line so he could direct water down his side and, and move on to where it would run into down on um, whatever that road is down there Shady Mile Shady Mile okay so he was trying to protect his property, okay? That was the only reason that we can see tonight that he put that wall up or he even applied for the permit, okay? But not, are you not the pond. He didn't put it up to, my belief here is that he did not put that up to pond water, hmm. okay? He did not. He did not. Based I, on I, the, please. Based, based on the contours on the, on the site plan, Yes, he did. He had it engineered, okay? He had that thing engineered according to statements here, okay? He had it according to his statement, his letter, he had it engineered by a firm, all right? And that firm says, this is where it should go. The man put it in. He went and applied for a permit. He got the permit, okay? Tell me. You, you can overrule me. You can overrule me. But I, I can't. Overrule but, me, too, but for in the 40, record. In 40 years, we've never allowed one property owner to build something that adversely impacts their neighbor. No doubt. My, and, I, and we've done that here as well. Okay? We've, we've always tried to protect the neighbor of someone's building, whatever it may be. We've done so, it. So when you go to the but, site but, plan. But, but my, my, my point is, Mr. Gotch, is that. We, this board, can't fix that, okay? Well, the, we cannot fix that, all right? The only thing that can fix that is the, the step higher here, I believe. And the board will make it. We'll go into discussion here a little bit later, and I'll, I'll express my opinion again then. But, and I probably should hold it till then, but we're in discussion. I don't see where, unless you can specifically state in, in the zoning ordinance 
to this board where they aired, then the results from what he put in is not in front of us. It, it's not. It's just not in front of us. It might, Mr. Scott, help me out here. Am I correct in what I'm saying? <clears throat> yeah, I, I think the other way to say that is um, the, the word jurisdiction. And again, this board derives its jurisdiction from the Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance. And when it talks about, when the zoning ordinance talks about the power and authority of this board, it talks about the, um, the, the ability to hear or the authority to hear appeals when there is an alleged error in any order, requirement, decision, or determination in regard to the enforcement of this ordinance. And so we've got to be careful. This, of course, is not a court of law. Right. And we don't have the authority to apply the common law to a private dispute between, between two private landowners. We've just got to, as, as, as difficult as the facts may be, this is just not the appropriate forum for that. Now, the one thing that may have been hit on here, and I'll say this sort of gratuitously, but the question is, is this a bona fide retaining wall, and therefore was the permit properly issued for a retaining wall, quote unquote. Okay. And Rita, I, I think your question's a good one. So when they list the reason for building a wall on the permit, do they list a reason why? And if he put to if retain water, the, does that change? If they look change? at the permit, and now I've got the permit. Because uh, I don't have the permit up here. Marked here. The permit says description, quote, retaining wall, end quote. All right. And that's it. And that, that, that's, that's what the permit was issued for. Okay. I think the appellants would argue that, um, you know, under any reasonable definition, that this isn't actually a retaining wall. It's more of a de facto stormwater management device. Uh, of course, Lugum argues that, um, that, um, you know, it does fit the definition of a retaining wall. Obviously, the 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 CCO does not define retaining wall, uh, so we go to other sources. I think Mr. Hauser wanted to look at the uh, the uh, the building code, uh, but you know, I, I think that's a valid question. The issuance of this permit for a retaining wall is that actually what it is? And I think if you bring that question within the CCO, then I think this board may have the authority to at least debate, question, and make a decision on that issue. But I think we're also dealing with the unintended yeah. consequence of the wall, of it being right built. Now. And that's the hard part of this. Well, and that's, is, you know, on the flip side of that is, how do we get into the landowner's mind and determine what his intent was exactly. when he applied for the permit and say, well, okay, his intent not well, was not to build a, a retaining wall, but it was, to build a de facto stormwater management device. I, I don't know that well, we Well, you're can, right, because, and we can't even ask him I don't him know that we can here. do that. I mean, he's not even here. We can't even ask yeah. him. Yeah. So. Okay. Give us one moment. Or, All right. One moment, please, Mr. Gotcha's search. And, and I'll, for the record, too, it's um, no harm, no foul, absolutely, Mr. Gotch coming up here. The idea is not to zealously advocate for an outcome or not, just out of pride's sake. It's just call balls, call strikes, see if we made the right call. That's right. Uh, if Mr. Gotch is right that Comar mandates we require it, if that's a requirement we follow, that's going to overrule the CZO or the Stormwater Management Ordinance. Similar to how Comar's provisions on the critical area will override anything contradictory in our local law. I just don't know what that law is, and okay. I don't know if it exists. And is that the law that Mr. Guy is talking my about? My question is, if it becomes a stormwater wall, does that kick you into that stormwater ordinance being applicable? Got gotcha. you. And, and then at that point, then yes, you would have to review the stormwater pond under that ordinance. Hmm. And it would no longer be exempt at that point. Mr. Chairman, we have one more yes. person waiting. Uh, yeah, but I want to get this done first. I, I'll, I'll wait. 
We can give them I don't want to lose to train, look. huh? We can give them time to look. Okay. All right. right. Let's do that then. For the record, if you would, please give us your name and address. My name is Lisa Gould, and I live in Calvert, but I am Frank and Kathy Katzenberger's daughter, and I work here in St. Mary's. My address is 643 San Miguel Trail in Lesby. Okay. And raise your right hand, please. Do you declare and affirm under the penalty of perjury your testimonies and responses and statements you may give with the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. So um, your attorney had said that if there is not a definition in the law, that the common definition prevails. And as stated with different law firms, and it's available for a web search, there are some standard definitions for two sets of terms, one being retaining wall and the other for a dam. And if I may, I'd like to read them real quick. So a retaining wall is a structure designed and constructed to resist the lateral pressure of soil when there is a desired change in ground elevation that exceeds the angle of repose of the soil. The allowable height of the walls is stipulated in the zoning code. A dam, according to Cornell law, is an artificial barrier that has the ability to impound water, wastewater, or any other liquid-borne material for the purpose of storage and control of water. So my question to the board is, in the permitting process, when it came to light, you issued a permit for a retaining wall. The application was for a retaining wall. And so when it came to light that the work being done was not for a retaining wall, it was a vertical structure for the purpose of stopping liquid, did the county err in continuing to issue the permit and allowing the work to stand? Okay. Thank you. Any questions for, any, uh, excuse me. Uh, oh, sorry. Please. Uh, what's the definition of, of, re, of retaining wall? This thing looks to be like six inches high. So how can you call it a retaining wall? It's 18 inches. It's 18. I'm sorry. What I'm was sorry. That? It is a retaining wall is supposed to hold back soil. This does not hold back soil. It holds back water. That's not the definition of a retaining wall. So would you, would you call it a wall? Yeah. A wall or an artificial barrier to impede the flow of water, or a dam. I legally would term that wall a dam. So you call it a wall, even though it's only six inches high? Mm hmm Thank you. Yeah, and it also has, I believe, an 18, 18. under the ground footer, 18 inches footer underneath solid concrete. So concrete from top to bottom with no structures that would prevent a wall from falling over, like you would see in a retaining wall. In a retaining wall, by its definition of its construction, it's built to withstand pressure. What was built is not a retaining wall, by legal definition. And the county was made aware of it. And the county was made aware before the work even started, but they couldn't do anything about it until the permit, till the work started and the permit application was started. So the county had awareness that a retaining wall was not ever going to be built, but a dam or so a wall. So how do you tell the board how you know that? How do you By know? Tony, of the phone I'm calls and filings. But the wall had already started. No. Um, if I may, the first county notification occurred Summer when? Six Some Six months before the work started. Royce Balding? Yeah, Royce Balding. Royce. Our, our, our so, no, I can't. Thank you. I can address that. Well, get up here. Here. Yeah. I understand what you, the legal argument that you all are trying to evaluate and in issuing the permit with the facts that were known, I believe the county erred, but that's it's, my it's, opinion. It's pretty difficult on this end. No. Okay. 
And we do appreciate everybody's testimony. Um, however, <coughs> the uh, we'll get to we'll get to the bottom of some more of this as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hauser. Any questions for this witness? No. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Katzenberg. Yeah, let me just try to summarize things, okay? With having put in a formal complaint with Lugum, or with the county, let's put it this way, six months prior, and with notifying Lugum the morning of the situation, and they still issued a permit without any kind of investigation, to me, to summarize it, Lugum was do, did due diligence and negligence. They did not do um, due diligence in, in their process. So, in that, to be said with that, that permit was not issued with, uh, it was issued under false pretenses. They had, proper, they had proper notification from the community, which is me. They had proper notification before that. They could have stopped it and reviewed this. So Lugum is at fault. Okay. Not, not, the, not, the, not the neighbor, okay? Lugum is at fault. Okay. So. Thank you. And just to answer the question of the gentleman there, the wall isn't a few inches high. The wall goes down almost two feet in the ground, below ground, and then sits up two, three blocks above. So just below the four foot height from top to bottom. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Hauser, are you gonna need a few more minutes? I think you good. Article four of the zoning ordinance. Lose my spot. 4.1.2, authority. The provisions of this article are authorized pursuant to title four, subtitle one, of the em environment article on the annotated code of Maryland. The application of this ordinance and the provision herein shall be minimum erosion and sediment control requirements and shall not be deemed, uh, I'm in the wrong spot, a limitation repeal of any other powers granted to the county by law. Sorry. Oh, I was one paragraph too low. Uh, 4.1.1, the purpose of this, of this article is to protect, maintain, and enhance the public health, safety, and general welfare by establishing minimum requirements and procedures to control the adverse impacts associated with land disturbances. The purpose is to minimize soil and erosion and prevent off-site sedimentation by using soil erosion and sediment control practices designed in accordance uh, with the Code of Maryland Regulations, COMAR 26.17.01, the 2011 Maryland Standards with the Code of Maryland uh, with the specifications herein and the standards and specifications and the Stormwater Management Act of 2007 here and after the act. Uh, the imp implementation of this ordinance will reduce the negative impacts of land development on water resources maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of streams, and man minimize damage to public and private property. So I'm saying that is that would give you the authority to look at the stormwater management ordinance if you would interpret the wall as a stormwater embankment. If you would interpret it that way. If, yes. Okay. He, John's gonna, uh, John's gonna maybe Say the exact opposite of okay. what I said, though. <laughs> I probably am, but give me a second to read it. I mean, that's okay. Again, go back to Comar. Um, contribution I can make in the meanwhile to this robust discussion we've had tonight. IRC's definition of retaining wall is, 
and I lost it to go look up Komar. Um, but a, law, a wall not laterally supported that exists to resist soil loads or other imposed lo loads or other imposed loads is what's coming out of the International Residential Code, which again is where when we say retaining walls are exempt if they're under four feet high, that's coming out of the International Residential Code and only saying they're exempt for whatever restrictions the building code might imply on. That still doesn't get us into whether or not a setback applies. So setback, retaining wall doesn't figure at all. The, the words out of the Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance are fences or walls, period. No qualification. And again, still doesn't, I think, bring us into the sediment control and stormwater management and grading ordinance unless you hit 5,000 cumulative square feet of disturbance or I got to look over Jim's theory of the case once more. And what I'm saying, or unless you're building a stormwater pond, then the stormwater pond ordinance would apply. So. <sighs> I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. Just, just one uh, second. I got to make some notes. Jim, help me again. Where are you getting stormwater management pond? Well, I, I, I think if if we have to if if we have to abide by Comar and the Maryland standard specifications and the Stormwater Act, if I mean so the zoning ordinance is taking you to those other ordinances. So if you are building a stormwater structure, then regardless of being under 5,000 square feet, if you're building a stormwater pond, there's no pond that's going to be constructed that Public Works doesn't review. So I agree with you there that it's invoking those laws. And again, if Comar says there's a minimum standard that these must abide by, that's going to overturn any local law we have because that's how state laws and in local laws interact with each other. But where is it saying that we can deem this a stormwater management pond and therefore, despite that these apparently very obvious exemptions would apply, don't therefore apply. Is it going to be in Comar? Well, when you block the flow, you've created, when you dam up water, you've created it, a stormwater it, it Again, but what I'm looking for is a law that says, yes, this applies and it must be treated. Because the only actual law I'm looking at, not the invocation, not the general descriptions of policy and purpose and goals, but the only law I'm saying is that, seeing is that clearing or grading activities that it's for the sediment control, doesn't apply unless it's 5,000 square feet or more. And that stormwater management standards are not required unless it's total site development with cumulative well, site the, disturbance of 5,000 square feet or more. What you're arguing is the stormwater ordinance doesn't apply because the retaining wall is less than 5,000 square feet. But what you're not arguing is the stormwater ordinance doesn't apply when you build a stormwater pond. And again, when I, you I'm, build a stormwater pond, you, the stormwater ordinance applies. And I'm asking you, where do you think the law is that says stormwater ponds, irrespective of cumulative site disturbance, irrespective of size, notwithstanding any other provision of law to the contrary, words to that effect, that because it's a stormwater pond or a stormwater management device well, falls under well, this ordinance. Well, we move from the zoning ordinance at that point to the stormwater ordinance. Right. And start uh, looking at what's required to it, do a stormwater all right, can, can, we, can we pause here for one second? I would like to talk to Ms. Heinrichs, please. Can you come forward, please? Because I have some, I, I need to, I got some questions for land use because I, I hear what the two of you all are discussing, but I think it's, I'm going to let the director tell us if it's beyond what they would normally do. So you've, you've heard this conversation that we've been having here in the last few minutes, okay? When Mr. Ortez, and I don't know whether it's in your records or not, when he applied for this, did he insinuate what this wall was gonna be used for? I don't believe that he did other than he was building a retaining wall. And when someone asks for a retaining wall, what is, what's, what's your, the land use and growth management's normal procedure? If I, if I came in and asked you, I, I'm gonna put a retaining wall up on my property line, 
what what's what's going to happen? What's take you at your word? Okay, there is no deeper investigation prior to any permit being issued that you would inquire in because of this. And I'm going to go back to what Mr. Hauser's is hanging his hat on a little bit is that it's under 5,000 square foot. Yeah, well, with, with all due respect to the situation um, and the frustration and, and losses that have, you know, befallen the cats and burgers, I would say that my staff did not err in what they did in the review that they did. Um, and if we were to scrutinize every application going beyond the words of what somebody said, getting into the intent. I'm not sure that we'd issue any permits within any reasonable amount of time. I mean, there has to be that balance, right? We have to strike a balance between reasonableness mm -hmm. and um, making sure that people can do on their property what they can rightfully do, whether it's residential, commercial, institutional, industrial, all of those things. We have to strike a balance, and I believe under the circumstances, we did not err. For this particular case, due to the size of what they were doing, less than 400 square foot, I think of disturbance, if I read this thing correctly, would you or your department consult the Comar book for any of this? In all honesty, no. Thank you. And, and I think that's what what, what Ms. Andritz is saying is is the intent that the commissioners had several years ago right. when we were streamlining. Right. I think that's where you were as well earlier. You know that that's the intent to streamline this thing to help move this process through. And I think that's I think that's that's the bottleneck where we are right now. Is you you know. Um, we're hearing testimony from you about about Comar and where it directs down to St. Mary's County from the state level as far as water control and, and all that with your division is con is concerned. But with what I'm hearing and is that there has been some misjustice justice done to one of the neighbors, okay, because of this concrete barrier that's been put in and from land use and growth management it's it's a minor request for a permit and when it's a minor request for a permit don't let me put words in your mouth okay please when it's a minor request for a permit it's it's normally a non-issue and they issue the permit did i say that no, that, that, that is absolutely correct. Okay. Um, I believe my staff uh, followed the protocol and the law that was in front of them. Okay. Anyone have any other questions here? Yes, sir. Please. So the minor request obviously had unintended consequences, coupled with the fact that the neighbors called and complained and filed complaints before construction started. So it's not really a question, it's more of a statement. So that's what's complicating this matter even more besides the fact that Comar rules if they apply or not, or the county rules, how do they apply? It's the neighbors that are aggrieved try to get their um, concerns known well in advance and still everything happened the way it did. Mm -hmm. right. So that's adding to all of this. And those those complaints when they come into your office, where where did they go? Okay, I I just and I know that that's a a, a left field question, a left field question out here. Okay, where it's where not, did they go? It's not a left field question for us. Um, you know, as Joe uh, mentioned earlier, he is the head of um, our inspections division, and if a complaint um, is brought in to Lugum. That's where it goes. Okay. Okay. So if that complaint come in prior to issuance of a permit, 
what kind of discussion is held in the office with that kind of, let's say for this particular one, okay? Let me make sure that I understand the question. Okay. So if a complaint comes in that after it rains, um, there's a lot of water that ponds on the ground, we, I'm not sure that we would be able to dispatch an inspector because we'd be going out there pursuant to some action that was taken without a permit, mm -hmm. but just, and I don't mean any disrespect and I'm not trying to be flippant here, but if it was just to say that it's raining or it, it has rained and water seems to be ponding on my property, I'm not sure that there's anything for our inspectors to do unless there was some other land disturbance activity that had transpired and nothing had transpired until the wall was constructed. That's correct. So when a, when a water flooding problem comes in, it comes to public works, not to land use and growth management. So it's the public works inspectors that go out and, and look at the site. So uh, Roy Spalding was mentioned earlier this, this evening. He's a public works inspector. Mm -hmm. So uh, when Roy went out to look at it, then he would have been the contact to notify Lugum. Okay, so he did he actually go out and look at it? Do you know? He did beforehand, and in in the testimony was, uh, I didn't speak to Roy. I spoke to the head of construction inspection. So the testimony was that Roy went out before the wall was started, and then he came back out again after the wall was constructed, and then here's here's where uh, Mr. Hauser's arguing. Now we're on private property. And this is not a public works issue because we're outside the public right away. Was it, it's, it's what it makes, was it a public works issue prior to construction? Well, we get complaints for did, flooding all I'm over. So, so that's a, I, I could take to midnight on that one because, no. because uh, water that comes off the roadway, public works has to determine the water coming off the road, is it, is it a county issue to resolve the water, even though it's on private property, right. or is it a prop private property issue? So, so I guess in this case, if Mr. Spalding went out prior to the issuance of the permit, what what was his response? He he said that he's looking at the retaining wall, where they want to build a retaining wall. He doesn't have the benefit of the contours or the elevations that were shot. He's looking at it as a retaining wall is a is a land use and growth management issue, okay. and and then uh, when when I go out there and the wall I went to the site, so when the wall's up and it's it's straddling the bowl, then I say okay now we have a stormwater issue. Right, right. But that's after the that's site. why public works is right. involved. Okay, so at the beginning public works did go ahead and take a look and basically it wasn't under your responsibility at that point? It, it was n not at the beginning, correct? Okay, all right. Hmm. Any other questions? No, sir. So Mr. now Brother? that it's falling up under public works, what happens next? I mean, did this just move from Lugum and a permit conversation? No, I, I, don't, I don't think so, not yet. Else? Right, I think what he told me was that Mr. Spaulding went out and looked at it because they got the call from the flooding thing. Right. All right. And when he looked at it and he knew there was a retaining wall going up, he, uh, Mr. Gotch just said he, he, he said it was a, a lugum issue to take well, care Well, the, the retaining the, wall. Was, right. Right. And then, was. and then our, our um, manager of construction and inspection division went out to the site and I got sucked in at but that But he point. went out afterwards. Right. Yeah. After, right. after. So, it's so nothing yes. prior to the permit from your division was um, submitted to land use and growth management. Yeah, basically, let's see what the plan does. If they get a permit, there's nothing for us to right. okay. argue against. So they did um, communicate. There was a communication between your office and land use and growth management. And, and I communicated as well. Right. Prior to the prior to the permit, no, 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 no. During okay. the stop, 
work okay. order or, right. or right at the time of the issue but of Mr. the first Spalding's work comments, order. was that sent to land use at the beginning prior to permit? Uh, I, I believe he probably would have called them. Okay, and just told him it's not his told issue. Mr. Gold's, yeah. Is what he would have done? He would have said it's, it's not Department of Public Works, it's it's Lugum's. Uh, because it because it appeared to be a retaining wall. At gotcha. that point, you okay. don't know where, right. that's, how long. That's what I'm trying to get at. I'm just elevation. going to make sure that whatever happened and there's a, um, a standard operation of procedure through land use and growth management that it was followed. Right. Okay. And, and the, the follow-up procedure is, and I think this is what Mr. Bradley's getting at, is so I get calls. We, we have the 311 complaint system. So if you uh, log on to the web page, you can put a pin at your address, tell us what the complaint is. We have drainage complaints. We we get, it's uh, over, I think last year was 1,400 drainage complaints in the calendar year. So this is not something different than we right. get a call on all the time. Oh, great. Okay. But back to the question. Does this now move from land use gross management to public works? Or is this still between? No, I think it could. That's a very well, complicated de right. de decision making process in public works. Is this a county problem or is this a private homeowner problem? Right. And, and I think what I heard Mr. Scott was saying earlier was this is going to court, not. Mm. Is that correct? Well, and, and I don't necessarily think it's going to court, but whether or not it's a Lugum or a, or a Board of Public Works issue is, uh, of course, again, not in front of us. All right. Yeah. You know, That's kind of where I was going. I, I know I sound like I'm harping on our jurisdiction, but I just want to keep us in our lane. Good. Any more, any more questions? Any more comments? I'll, I'll get out of the way. And let <laughs> I think Mr. I... Unless, just looking up in Comar, 26.1701 and 02, the only thing I'm seeing are the same exemptions that exist in our local ordinances, that unless there's a cumulative disturbance of more than 5,000 square feet, stormwater management is not, review is not required as one of our local ordinances. It's the same for sediment and grading as well, with the addition that 100 cubic yards of feet are there as well. I'm just not seeing textual support right now for the idea that if it's a stormwater pond that makes it the stormwater ordinance applicable in spite of the exemptions. Okay. Are we good right now? Okay. Any other questions? Any other questions? For no, sir. Mr. All right. You can stay there for if, if you like. Okay. The, um, is there anyone else I hear that would like to give testimony in this case this evening? Seeing none, we'll close the public testimony. Mr. Scott, do I have to do any cross-examination with any of these, with the appellant or? Yeah, you don't, Mr. Chair. I'd like to give them both a chance for any closing statements. Absolutely, okay. And the appellant will go first? Yes, sir. Okay. So, um, where are we out here? The, um, Katzenbergs, Mr. Ms. Katzenbergs, if you all would like to give a closing argument, a closing statement, not argument. I think we've done enough arguing, closing statement, conclusion, beating the dead horse, whatever you want to call all of this. We've done our best. Yep. And really wanted your help. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hauser. I second that. I think we have said enough and just submit this to whatever decision the board's going to make. Okay, Mr. Katzenberg. All I'm asking, and I'm not saying that, I'm just asking, reverse the, the permit. That's all I'm asking. Okay. Thank you. All right. <laughs> All right. We've done the public testimony. We've closed public testimony. We are, the hearing is now closed for any verbal and written 
comments. And it's we in the board discussion and decision at this point. So on my I'm just open for discussion and I think when I take the emotion away from it, it's not stormwater management. And I don't think it's a retaining wall. I think it's just separation of property. And I think we ought to re retain the uh, permit. Okay. I don't believe that Logum or the person issuing the permit did anything wrong. I think they followed procedure, what they were, it, it, what the policy was to follow the procedure. But what I do question is Mr. Ortez, yes. Ortez, I don't think it was clear, okay, what his intentions were for what the wall was there for. So therefore, when Lugum issued the permit, they were going off of what Mr. Ortez had put on that permit. That's why I'm saying I don't think that Lugum issued the permit um, that they that they shouldn't have, okay? Because you, you know, you need to move things along. But I'm also in in Mr. Ortez's um, request. He says retaining wall, and I still go back to that it is to hold back soil. It could be rock. It's some kind of uh, structure like that to keep it from the earth from shifting forward. So I don't think that that wall is really, you would say, like a retaining wall in that way. I agree. So I, I guess what I would like to see, um, and I don't know if it's in our purview or not, is, you know, that there is some type of flow through there and that, um, maybe it directs away from the garage, but that's, you know, I'm not an engineer of that type. Or some type of mediation where the two parties get together and come up with that they must find somehow that both parties are happy with the end result. Okay. Mr. Bradley? My big concern is that uh, one of our neighbors went out and made a complaint and made their um, concerns known well in advance and that seems to have gotten lost in the shuffle do I think that policy and procedures were followed accordance with the building permit yes could there be some changes in policy and procedure to take in these kinds of issues because this is probably not a one-off this is um, I just hope this doesn't happen a lot, but kind of look internal and go, okay, how could we pr improve that communication flow so that we address these concerns? But looking at all of the rules and regs and all of the discussion, unless there's a state law that trumps this, I think that the Lugum issued the permit given the information they had in accordance with what they were following in their policies and procedures. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Payne. Well, it appears to me that uh, the issuing the permit was the thing to do. Uh, do they need to tighten up policies and procedures? Yes. I've talked about this before in other cases counter examples and that's where this applies it's just something that happens once in a great while that's uh hasn't been addressed sufficiently on any level so that's where i would like to see improvement as far as the two homeowners Hey, listen, you, you know, you got to find common ground somehow. And that's all. Thank you. So Thank you. let me ask a question. Yes. Does the county have Spanish interpreters? Because they said there's a language barrier. 
can the appellants use county Spanish interpreters to help them out? We can ask that question. Yeah, I am. So. Okay. okay. <clears throat> Does the county have Spanish interpreters to help you guys out communicate with your neighbor? Could this be resolved with, as I like to point out, a neighborly discussion? You have the county rep there who's just there to interpret, interpret, and y'all hopefully go figure this out. He punches some holes in the wall and you move forward. I mean, that's, let's look at the human answer on this one. Okay. Don't look at me like that, John. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I, I'm, I'm in agreement with the rest of the board. I think, I think the, um, the, the Katzenbergs are between a rock and a hard spot here. I, um, I'm disappointed that Mr. Ortez wasn't here to, to answer questions yes. for the board and um, would helped us, could have helped us to light a lot more, I believe, if he was here. The, um, the issuance of the permit, uh, listening to the director and the, su and the supervisor of, of permits, it, it, it's a standard thing to do every day. They do it every day, okay? So someone comes in and asks for a permit, I'm putting up a wall, you know, unless it's large enough, then if they did that, they would be tied up doing one permit a week probably. Yeah. So they, and as Mr. Gotch said, spoke, Early on, back in his tenure uh, with these uh, zoning ordinance and, and Comar stuff, they, they kind of bottlenecked it some and get rid of some of the, the larger things out there so they could move things quicker through and don't have to go through all that. So this was a kind of a small project, less than 400 square foot. There was no reason for them to, to uh, bring in Comar, okay? That doesn't touch until you get above the 5,000 square foot mark. You know, the, the definitions, depend on who's reading what book, is what you get out of it, okay? So the man put up a wall, okay? For what reasons? We don't know. Um, the county gave him the permit. The county went out, and once the appeal started, they, they, they stopped work order again for that piece of it. But the phone call, the, the, the complaint came in to DPW, okay? So um, Mr. Spaulding, somewhere along the line, made a phone call to Lugham and said, you know, we've been down there. If you're gonna put, you know, if you're gonna issue a permit, then that's under your jurisdiction. So the communication, I think, and Mr. Young was down there. So mm -hmm. the communication between the departments was there. So I don't, I, I feel terrible about what has happened, the outcome of this thing, but as far as the appeal itself, I don't believe that land use and growth management erred in any judgment there at all. So. Are we ready for a motion? I'm ready for a motion. In the matter of ZAAP 23-2707, case of Mr. Kusselbaums, I move to uphold the permit issued by the county. I have a motion on the floor. Second. I have a second. We'll start with Mr. Bradley. Aye. Aye. Uphold. Aye. Aye. In order, Mr. Vaughn, Mr. Uh, Mr. Ms. Katzenberg, um, in order reflecting the board's decision will be prepared by staff and signed by the board within 30 days, 60 days, I'm sorry. A 30-day period follows from the date the order is signed during which any aggrieved party may appeal this board decision in circuit court. Any action taken during that time will be at your own risk, and we'll send you an order once it's signed. But, you know, I know you've got dollars tied up in it already. I, like Mr. Bradley and, 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 and um, the rest of the board has suggested that, you know, somewhere along the line you, you should be able to w somehow work things out, okay? If you are unable to work things out with Mr. Ortez, you have relief in the court system, okay? So that's where we are this evening. Thank you.
I did not. <laughs> no. I didn't think it was going to take that long, but. All right. Are we ready with the Zoom? Do you need a couple minutes? I believe we're fine. Should we take Mr. Wachowski and Mr. Moody, can you hear yeah, can proceedings? We? Yes, can you hear us? We yes. Can. Thank you. Okay. If he. Ms. Ms. Clemens, can we just take about three or four minutes? Yes, that please? would be wonderful. We, Thank we'll you. adjourn for about three or four minutes and we'll be right back.
um, the board can have a discussion. Okay? Great. Yep, if you have any questions along the way, don't hesitate to ask. Thank you Perfect. <laughs> that means we're back in session. Yep. Okay, we're back from our recess. Our next case this evening is Brabham and Porterfield variance request VAAP 23-1756. Ms. Clements, are you going to read the whole the request here? Yes, I here? can read and all I don't of need that to do for that. you. <laughs> Save so a little time. This, you're still on the oath. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Okay. The next public hearing is variance application 23-1756. The Brabham and Porterfield property. They are requesting a variance from the St. Mary's County Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance from section 71.8.3 to disturb the 100 foot critical area buffer, section 41.7.45 for the development closer to the water than the principal structure on the adjacent property, section 41747C for an area of impervious coverage for all accessory structures exceeding a thousand square feet for the in the entire buffer located on the property and from section 51.3 um, 122 to reduce the required pool setback from 10 feet to 7 feet to install a replacement pool with a patio and deck Okay, the legal advertisement was printed on February 2nd and 9th, 2024 in the Southern Maryland News. Certified mailings were sent to the adjacent property owners located within 200 feet of the project property, and a public hearing sign was posted on the property on or before February 6, 2024. The owners of the property are Ralph Brabham and Andrew Porterfield, the property consists of 20,000 square feet and is developed with an existing home, pool, patio, shed, parking, and walkways. The applicant is requesting the variance to construct a new pool, patio, decking, and, park, and parking. The pro current proposal has health department and soil conservation approval and the critical area um, responded on 116 2024 and it's in your attachments to the staff report let's see the property is located at one four or excuse me four two one one five white point beach road in leonardtown it is zoned rural preservation the critical area overlay is limited development area with the buffer management overlay. And the applicant is proposing a new deck and a replacement pool patio and relocating their parking. Okay, the, um, and we've got the site plan detail a little bit closer. Here, I can explain it a little bit more in depth for you. Okay, we have the existing house with the existing pool, and the pool deck is here in red. They're going to remove this existing pool deck. They're going to replace the pool shell in kind. This new brick area is new patio. They are removing the existing walkway, concrete steps down to the water. They're also removing this existing concrete sidewalk and adding this new one out to White Beach, White Point Beach Road. In addition, they're removing this existing parking and adding this ribbon driveway. Okay. Okay, 498 square feet of mitigation will be required to be planted in the buffer and a buffer management plan and a critical area planting agreement will be required um, prior to the approval of the issuance of a permit. Do, okay. Do we have any questions? Any questions for staff? Ms. Clements? No. Thank you, Ms. Clements. We don't have any questions at this time. Okay. Thank you. 
So we'll ask um, Mr. Brabham and Mr. Porterfield. If you want to come forward, please. Yeah. Okay. We've got their. Um, yeah, we've got their. Landscape architects. Yes, yes, our landscape architects are going to make the primary pre presentation. We're okay, but to... you can come up and stand. Okay. I'll get before you sit down. I'll get you sworn in in the event we have any questions for you. Okay. Fantastic. Do you declare and affirm under the penalty of perjury that the testimonies, responses, and statements you may give will be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Okay. And if you would have a seat and give us, if you would give us your name and address, please. Absolutely. Uh, my name is Ralph uh, Golden Brabham. My current address is 1543 9th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20001. My name is Andrew Ray Porterfield III. My address is 1543 9th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C., 2001 as well. And sir, what, what was your last name again? Uh, Brabham, B-R-A-B-H-A-M. Got you. Okay. Thank you. All right, and who do we have on Zoom? We have Ryan Moody and Nick Wachowski, if I said that properly. Yes. And they will need to be sworn in additionally, oh, yep, too. Yep. Moody, and what was the last other one? Um, like, um, yep, W-I-T-T-K-O-F-S-K-I. Okay. All right, gentlemen, please raise your right hand, if you would, please. Do you declare and affirm under the penalty of perjury that the testimony, responses, and statements you may give will be the whole truth and nothing but the truth individually, please? I do. I do. Thank you. And for the record, your name and address, please. Uh, my name is Ryan Moody. Address is 1441 East Capitol Street, Southeast Washington, D.C. Okay. And my name is Nicholas Witkowski, and my address is 507 F Street, Northeast, Apartment B, Washington, D.C., 20002. Okay, thank you. And what brings all you gentlemen to St. Mary's County? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I guess you're getting ready to tell me, right? Who wants to be here? <laughs> we okay. we Who? want to go swimming. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, right, right. Who wants to start? <laughs> Uh, I'm happy to start. Uh, and if, because point. because we're running Zoom, if you're going to speak from the Zoom, if you would identify yourself first, so we know so we know who we're talking to. Sure. Uh, so my name is Ryan Moody. I'm a, a founding principal of Moody Graham, which is a landscape architecture office in Washington D.C. Um, are we able to pull up the PowerPoint? Uh, yes, I have um, the first slide up. Oh, I am not able to see that. Okay. It's showing the whole room right now. Okay, I can change that. Perfect. Well, we'll start uh, just by saying thank you to the chairman and the board members for the opportunity How to so? um, to present this evening. Oh, no. Okay. Not. Technology. <laughs> technology, right? Andrew, may I have your assistance? I think I've got it. Can you see? Hold on. Yep. How about that? Can you see the PowerPoint now? Yep. Now we're getting there. Perfect. Okay, great. You can go ahead on to the next page, please. Um, so, yeah, I just want to say thank you to the chairman and board members for their time this evening. Um, we also want to say thank you to Sherry Young, Stacey Clements, and Amanda Yall, who have all been very helpful and professional um, in helping us uh, prepare this submission. So that's much appreciated. Um, go ahead to the next page. This is just a photograph of the existing conditions. We'll show you a bit more uh, following up. If, if I, uh, Mr. Moody, yeah. Mr. Moody, I, this is uh, Chairman Hayden. If I may interrupt just a bit, and I just need to give you a little bit of our housekeeping. Our last case ran extremely long, and we don't continue our cases after 10 o'clock. Okay. Got it. So we have about we have about 15, or we have about 20 minutes because I don't have any other business after this. But if we okay. don't get through your case, which I don't believe we will this evening, we'll 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 continue it to a specific date and time in the future. Okay. We will do our best to expedite the explanation, and hopefully. Um... Don't don't rush yourself because. 
you got 20 minutes and I think we got so few questions with this board. Okay. Okay. No so problem. just take your time and okay. make your presentation and then we'll continue at a specific date and time. Sure. Sounds good. Um, I think uh, it's been clearly stated um, the, um, the relief that we're seeking um, section 71.8.3 for disturbance in the critical area buffer um, as well as um, of disturbance for or some uh, relief for area of impervious coverage and um, reducing the required full setback. Um, so this first page just gives us a photograph of the existing conditions. We'll go through a few more in the following slides. Next slide, please. Uh, just a vicinity location map so everyone understands uh, where the property is located. Next slide, please. Um, here we get a little bit more zoomed in to the property location on White Point Beach Road. Um, the house is highlighted in white and the existing pool that um, we're hoping to replace in, in kind is shown in blue. The critical area um, delineation, the 100 foot critical area buffer setback line is shown in the dashed red line and the critical area buffer is highlighted um, in pink there. Goodbye, please. Uh, a few existing conditions photographs of, of the home. Um, it should be noted that the, the house is currently being renovated under a separate permit. So these photographs were taken uh, prior to that renovation beginning. Um, but we get a little bit of the character of the backyard as well as showing the uh, existing well location. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the existing site plan. Uh, with notes for the um, some of the proposed demolition. So you can see the existing swimming pool uh, noted on this drawing, it's approximately 40 feet by 24 foot uh, in dimension. And it has an existing uh, 775 foot square foot concrete paving pad that uh, currently surrounds it. Now there's a set of concrete steps uh, leading down the hillside. There is a 60 inch diameter willow oak that is very close to the um, existing swimming pool. Uh, that willow oak has been assessed by Bartlett tree experts and appears to be in healthy condition, uh, but does need some limbs to be trimmed from it. Um, there is another 32 inch diameter oak that's of, of good size in the front yard, um, just a little bit south of the existing shed that is worth noting. We've also noted the existing well and the 15 foot um, setback required from that well in the red dashed line. Um, on the site plan. Next slide, please. Um, some of the existing conditions photographs to give you an understanding of the current conditions of the pool. Um, unfortunately, the pool is um, beyond repair. Um, it's been looked at by two pool contractors, two pool experts, uh, each of which have um, uh, provided their professional opinion that the pool uh, needs to be replaced. And so the proposed um, site plan, and actually just to walk through these photos, you can see the existing chain link fence, um, the existing concrete in not great condition, the pool shell, uh, the existing steps, and um, a little bit of the foundation shown there as well as the existing willow oak. Slide, please. Uh, two more shots of the pool to give you a little bit of a uh, little bit further context and um, showing the existing conditions as well as the critical area zone. Next slide, please. The proposed site plan, we're trying to um, rebuild the pool in the exact same location. Um, so same size, same location, in-kind pool construction. We are proposing to move the pool equipment outside of the critical area zone. It's currently inside the critical area. Uh, move that outside the critical area. Um, we're proposing a dry laid stone patio surrounding the pool, as well as a small uh, platform deck that's elevated about six inches off the ground uh, surrounding the rear facade of the house. Dimensions on that are approximately four foot six on the sides and approximately six foot in depth in the back. As noted, there is a new uh, lead walk leading out to White Point Beach Road proposed for the um, home entry and um, a permeable gravel ribbon driveway for uh, parking along the side yard. Um, also noted on this plan are some of the proposed um, plants, which um, we're not going to go into. We'll go into too much detail, but um, uh, these would be um, uh, all almost all actually. No, I believe they are all native uh, species except for one of the trees. Um, 
and uh, this would be required for the building permit as noted for the um, uh, the critical area disturbance. Next slide, please. Uh, here we've got images and locations of some of the proposed trees. So we have some uh, proposed um, overstory uh, native trees in front, um, some screening uh, river birch trees along the side yard, and some uh, native uh, magnolia, sweet bay magnolia trees um, near the uh, southeast corner of the property, as well as one proposed um, American holly on the west side of the property, and then some screening trees to provide some, uh, additional privacy from the neighbor uh, evergreen trees along the um, east property line. Next slide, please. Uh, and I believe this is our last slide, just showing some of the uh, proposed native shrub plantings as well in the critical area uh, buffer zone. Um, right now, this area has quite a bit of um, invasive um, ground cover, English ivy in it. And so um, there's also some discussion about trying to replace that ivy with uh, native ground cover species. <laughs> so with that, we thank you for the opportunity to present and, and look forward to answering questions from the board. Okay. Anybody have any questions for Mr. Moody? Yes, I do. Uh, have you guys read the Critical Area Commission's response? I don't believe we've seen that. All right. So historically, and what the Critical Area Commission uh, talks about is they're opposed to this variance request uh, because <clears throat> they basically, and traditionally, they have not uh, thought of swimming pools as something that, um, let me see if I can find their exact words. I'm not going to worry about it. Usually they don't approve swimming pools and they push back on swimming pools to the point where they've taken the county to court over a couple of swimming pools. So I think with their, that, their kind is that the swimming pools do not meet unwarranted hardship. There, there you go, unwarranted hardship. So mm -hmm. with that, <clears throat> and they do spell out some requirements that they're lying out, have you guys looked at that? And would you be amenable to changing the layout of the pool to meet uh, what they're asking? Um, sure. So we've looked at alternate options for the layout of the pool. Unfortunately, because of the critical and structural root zone of the large tree, um, the required setbacks and the depth of the critical area, there doesn't seem to be another location that makes sense to site the pool. Um, so in that regard, from a disturbance level, we think it makes sense to place the pool exactly where it is so that we're not disturbing more soil, excavating another hole in the ground. Um, we would also refer the board to the uh, Whittles 2023 variance request of EAAP 22-1882, uh, which had similar circumstances of a pool replaced in kind within the critical area. All right, so I think what they're really pushing back on is the patio area, and I think they're looking at some of the gravel um, some of the surrounding area of the pool itself, not necessarily replacing the pool it's uh, in kind. So yeah. Yeah, and so we tried to with the deck, um, you know, water would obviously flow through that deck, there would be gravel underneath. So we're, we're seeing that as a, a permeable surface, uh, the patio space, um, we're proposing it as a dry lake system as opposed to setting it on a concrete base, the current surrounding uh, concrete around the pool is poured concrete that is impervious. Um, so we're, we're trying to make this a more sustainable option uh, while still providing enough space for the homeowners to, you know, um, be able to put out chairs and, and use the space around the swimming pool. Okay. The second thing is I noticed that your new patio goes close to your wellhead. Is it going to cover the wellhead or are you going to need to move that? Correct. And so we've been in discussion, uh, I believe, with the county about that. There's a regulation that requires um, a certain type of rig to get in to potentially repair or access that well. And um, so once again, by dry laying the pavers, that allows these pavers to be pulled up if necessary for that rig to get in. Uh, we originally had a deck structure shown in that location. We, we did revise the design after, after talking uh, with the county uh, to go to a, a patio at grade with the, with the removable pavers. Um, so that was a modification we made and, and we're thankful for that, uh, that advice. 
So given the fact that you guys are replacing the pool in kind, that you have uh, existing considerations of the wellhead and other geographical features, that seems to be the best place to put the pool and the surrounding deck um, and would probably answer Critical Area Commission's questions on that. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, we feel confident that this is the right place to uh, build the pool uh, in its place that disturbs the least amount of area uh, and has the least negative impacts on the critical area. All right. Does the deck that you guys are proposing around the house have any stairs or uh, steps leading off of it? It does not. It has a single six inch step. Uh, so it's, it's raised as, as really just kind of a platform. Um, this allows us to keep the framing uh you know, at grade or, or above ground as opposed to burying it um, in the grade, uh, which would lead to faster deterioration from water. Okay, thank you. That's all the questions I have. But you, Mr. Moody, this is Chairman Hayden again. You said you didn't get, you don't, you're not aware of the critical areas comments? No, um, we just uh, learned of that when they were um, mentioned this evening. So do any of you all have a critical area? Comments? Have any of y'all read it? I, I know that, uh, I believe that you, Nick and Ryan, have been in communication with the Critical Area Office. I don't know if there are specific comments in the record apart. Uh, you, I think. Yeah, we've got, they're part of the. Yeah, they're, they're right? part of. January 16th. They're, they're part of the okay. staff report tonight. <clears throat> yeah. So I think. Oh, oh, are, but uh, Nick and Ryan, are y'all, are they dated or mm -hmm. uh, uh, just to make sure we're all talking about the same comments? Yes. Because I know Dated that you're January 16th, 2024. Yes. Okay. I feel like Nick and Ryan have probably have these if yeah. they're from Janu January 16th. I don't 16th. believe we received those comments. We, okay. Like I said, we have been in contact with the county. They've been very helpful in advising us on uh, some of the modifications to the proposed elements. Um, and we're happy to, to continue, you know, answering questions or, or make adjustments. If the, I think we're gonna, we're gonna shut this down here in a couple of minutes anyway. I think you should um, take time and Ms. Clements, did they, get, uh, did they get a copy of this? I would assume so, that okay. would be. So somewhere along the line, I'm sure the county has sent you copies of this. I would, but I would, would if I was, if I was to would that have been a, uh, sent via mail or email, or how would we have received that? Probably <clears throat> uh, email. So, is, so it, is there a, is it possible to confirm that that was sent? If 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 I may, I could probably look and see. Um, typically, they're provided via email when we receive them to the applicant, and then they are posted on board docs a week. Well, the Friday before the hearing, mm -hmm. available for the public. Um, uh, that's all I would say. About right. It. And I can look at so my email. So the, the, I'm looking for your, right you would have been, Mr. Bradham, you would have been the um, applicant here. So the, the information would have been sent to you. I've certainly not received it via. No. Okay. I think so, Nick, Nick, I think, they I, were I think I'm, I'm, I'm technically the applicant so um, for this application. So I was the one receiving. Um, hmm. uh, yes, Mr. Wachowski was the. Okay. So anyway, the you should have the information. And what I would suggest, because we'll, we're going to pick a date to continue this, is that you get familiar with the responses that came back in from the critical, critical area commission. And um, then we can talk a little bit more about um, what Mr. Bradley had questioned. Is that okay, Mr. Bradley? Once they get familiar with the uh, comments from the Critical Area Commission. I don't think so. And he didn't hear you. I said once they get familiar with the responses from the Critical Area Commission, then we can readjust address your question. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay. I think so, it's... So that's, that's what I would suggest is make sure you've seen the, uh, the staff report. Make sure you have seen the Critical Area Commission's comments and are familiar with what they're talking about. So, And then um, we'll readdress some of these questions when we reconvene again. Yeah. Okay? So... Go ahead, Mr. Richardson. Could I add to that, please? Yes. 
The advice should be well taken. I would, did anybody go inside the pool to look at it? It looks terrible on the outside. <laughs> I mean, terrible. Yeah, the, but did the, anybody actually go inside to check the structure? Uh, uh, we, we've had pool contractors come and look at it. I'm, I'm a little hard of hearing. Sorry. We've, we've certainly had pool contractors out to uh, assess it. Uh, and Taylor uh, Engineering uh, assessed the soil and said everything was looked good from that perspective. The person we bought that we've been looking for property down here for um, a couple years now, specifically for properties with a pool. And the owner um, who sold us this property uh, said that the pool, despite its condition, which is not cute right now, uh, so said that the pool uh, uh, was still in good condition to be like relined or or repurposed in that way. But no, I've not I've not taken a dip in that quite yet. But I, only I, way I would you can encourage see in the pool you to is through the holes in the cover. Yeah, I would encourage you to go can. inside the pool and look at the structure. It, it can be relined, I would think, but you know, <clears throat> the the pyramids are still standing, and and, yeah. and I'm not being joking. But you need to look at inside yourself and look at the structure because it may be may be okay. Somebody would like to have you build a new one, I'm sure, and a new one's a lot nicer, but. I would ask you to somebody go. Is it if it's holding water? It's probably cold right now, but I would I would encourage you to look at somebody. One of you two look at the structure itself. Actually, if they've had yeah. pool companies look at it, they've assessed the structure into it, and and we can get a report, written report back from the pool company. Okay. Yeah, we uh, Sunset Pools did come and look at it, and they they assessed it, and, and as mentioned, their their professional uh, experience. Uh, they said it should be replaced. And they give you so that in writing. You have you have it written. Uh, we have yeah, we have some information okay. from them. Okay. Then we, we would we would like to have a copy of that prior to our next meeting. Okay. Okay. So, any other questions at this point? No, mm -hmm. sir. Just a word of advice to you guys: don't take the critical area commission's uh, recommendations lightly. Do go well. in and look at them because there could be consequences to that. So. Absolutely. Okay. So let's pick a date. Um, Ms. Clements, can you tell me? I know we have a, another one on the 14th. Is that Correct. full? Yes, we have four cases that night. Okay. So our, in March, do we have the room here set for the... The 28th? Yes. The second or the fourth Thursday of the month? Yes. I believe so. The 28th? Yes. Is that? Can, let me double check. Let me double okay. check. We're, we're double checking on the room for that night. Usually the fourth Thursday. I apologize. I've got a calendar in here somewhere. I just need to figure out what was on. Is that a firm date? Not yet. Okay. She's checking yeah, to make sure the room's we're available. That the That's room's okay. Available. If the room is available, is that good for the board members? That works for me. Mr. Payne, that work for you? The 28th. It's uh, a Thursday. March. March. I'm not seeing her calendar on here, and I don't have access to the S drive. So um, I believe it's, it's normally the fourth Thursday in March that we reserve. So unless there's a holiday or some strange thing that got in the way with that reservation. So what I would do would be to confirm with the board and the applicants um, if it's not on the 28th or either way we'll confirm the date right so uh, we'll we'll do we want to set it for the 28th then are you pretty comfortable with that I think so. and if something has to change how do we re-advertise we can make it the first hearing on the April 4th uh, 9th April 11th actually yep I believe there can be um, some kind of decision by the chair um, moving it if it if we determine that the 28th is not an available date, correct? Yes. 
Yeah, correct. Uh, Mr. Chair, that, that uh, once uh, staff finds out if we have the room, you, you have that discretion. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, um, so, so we don't have to repost it. I would like to right. go ahead and, and set that date for the, for, um, the 28th, 28th now at 6.30. At 6.30 here. And if something changes, we'll take it to the 11th? That would be the yes, we can. Yes, I can make sure that it goes first thing, first agenda item on the 11th. Okay. Does those two dates work for you all? Absolutely. Yes, uh, yes the 28th works. Um, and the 11th, the 11th, uh, we will do our best to make work. Okay. Okay. So hopefully we can do it on the 28th. As long as the room, I think the room will probably be available. So, mm -hmm. all right. I just need a motion to continue this hearing 28th at 6:30, please. I make a motion to continue this to the 28th of March. I have a motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. We'll see you all on the 28th of March at 6:30. That's great. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Nice. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. We don't have any. We don't have any other business tonight. We don't have any minutes to approve, and we don't have any orders to approve. So, any good for good for the order? Make motion to adjourn. I have a motion on the floor. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you.